Hi, I'm Craig, and I'm a developer. This course is going to introduce you to the wonderful programming language, Python. There are absolutely no prerequisites for this course. This is intended to be the beginning of your Python journey. It's gonna be awesome. I'm excited for you. Python is such a wonderful language to start with. It's been designed to be clean and easy to read. If you're coming from another programming language, you'll find the simplicity of this language just delightful. If this is your first programming language, you're in for a lot of fun. You'll get the opportunity to think in ways that you've most likely never thought before. You'll challenge yourself to grow, learn, and create in new and fun ways. Python is a general purpose language, which means it can be used to build well, just about anything. The US government uses Python to do statistical analysis and data visualizations. Spotify, Evernote, and OkCupid rely on Python for personalized recommendations and other artificial intelligence based tasks. Disney, Pixar, Lucasfilm, and others use Python to provide more realistic effects in their movies. Large familiar websites like YouTube, Instagram, Reddit, Pinterest, and even The Onion lean on Python. You can use Python for face and speech recognition. You can control robots and shoot lasers, send an email when your doorbell rings, and just about anything you can imagine. So what do you say we get started learning this incredible language? Oh shoot, wait a second. Before we get too excited, and I go too fast, I'd like to take a moment and let you get familiar with your learning environment. There's speed controls on the video player. You should totally feel free to speed me up or slow me down to your heart's content. If you miss something I said, please feel free to scrub the video back and make me repeat myself. Now, unlike a typical in-person classroom, here at Treehouse, you're in complete control of your learning session. Attached to each video, there are detailed teacher's notes. I'll do my best to point out when there's something in there that you just have to see, but try to get in the habit of checking that area for juicy bits of additional knowledge. Another thing I want you to remember is that you aren't taking this course alone. Although they probably aren't sitting right next to you, many of your fellow students are taking this course right now. And chances are, they'll be having many of the same emotions that you're bound to be experiencing as you pick up this language. Please make use of the community. It's amazing, and you're part of it, it's yours. If you have a question, please ask it. You'll be surprised how quickly you'll receive a friendly and helpful answer. And also, a great way to make your learning stick is to explain a concept or solution that you just learned. You'll probably surprise yourself with how quickly you'll sound like a pro. I'll bug you more about this as you progress, but please make sure to check out the forum and hang out with your fellow students, answering their questions. It's a win-win. I'll pop in there too quite a bit, and there's also an amazing team of moderators who are here to help. We should talk a bit about what learning a programming language is most likely going to feel like. I'd love for you to approach this journey much like you would when you attempt to learn a foreign language. There are going to be a lot of new terms and concepts introduced, and I want you to not stress about fully understanding everything all at once. Just like you wouldn't expect to be fluent after taking your first Spanish class, you shouldn't expect to be able to understand all the code you see immediately. Learning takes practice, both in Spanish and Python. <laughs> Spanish speakers are typically more forgiving than computers. But just like in your hypothetical Spanish class, you can expect it to feel super good when you can actually communicate your thoughts in your new language, and we'll get there soon. So do this for me. I want you to immerse yourself in the language. I'll point out exactly what I think you need to focus on at this part of your journey. But again, please don't worry about knowing everything. Remember, this is a journey, and you are just now beginning. As you progress, you'll start to notice that you're picking up quite a bit just through immersion. In this course, we're going to explore the basics of the Python language. All of the concepts that you'll learn here are common in just about every programming language that I can think of. By the end of this course, you'll build a ticket purchasing application for an event. There will be loops, logic, error handling, and even some math. What you're looking at here is called a command line application. And this up here is our online code editor called Workspaces. In just a short bit, you're gonna be able to write this code from scratch. Wow, future you is pretty amazing, right? So what are we waiting for? Let's go get you up and running in your very own online code editor Workspaces. All right, so let's get your Workspace open. Remember, Workspaces is your online coding environment. It's web-based, so you can code from anywhere on any computer with an internet connection. Now, I recommend that you also have a physical keyboard. Coding on a tablet is a bit of a bummer. 
I've attached a workspace to this video. You should see a button that says launch workspace. Go ahead and give that a click. All right, welcome to Workspaces. This is all yours. So over here, we'll see a list of files. Underneath this Python basics here, it says hello.py. Uh, let's go ahead and click that. So this little area here, this is what is known as a text editor. And you'll see here, we have a tab open. This is a tab. And this is where we're gonna be writing our code. Now, as you can see, there is a single line of code here. And you'll notice that the text is in different colors. As you can see, there's like a reddish color and then there's a teal color here. This is called syntax highlighting. Syntax is the rules of the language. Now, this syntax highlighting is just one way that our editor is gonna help us out. The traditional first step when learning any programming language is to write this phrase here, this hello world. You gotta write that out to the screen. It's like a rite of passage. And its history dates way back to the 1960s. I wanted you to be a part of this tradition. So there's more information in the teacher's notes. So here it is. Here is hello world in Python. What this script is instructing the computer to do is to output or print the string, the string here, which is a series of letters and numbers, hello world, to the screen. Now, you might have noticed that I'm referring to this file named hello.py as a script. That's because we are going to pass this file to what is known as the Python interpreter. And the interpreter is going to read through this file just like a movie script, line by line. The Python interpreter will then interpret meaning from your script and perform it or evaluate each line of code. This bottom area here is known as the console. Now this is a terminal session running on your very own version of Linux. Linux is an operating system much like Windows or Mac OS. Now, depending on which operating system you're running on your local machine, you also have an application like this available to you. It's usually tucked away. This is what is actually running underneath all of those windows. So on a Windows machine, this console is called the command prompt or the PowerShell. On Mac OS, it's called a terminal. But this here is running in the cloud for you, so you don't need to worry about getting things set up on your local machine just yet. Check out the teacher's notes if you'd like to learn more. And this here is called the command prompt. This little tilde here means that I'm in my home directory, and this slash means that I'm in a subfolder or a subdirectory named workspace. Directories are synonymous with folders in most operating systems. Now this workspace directory, again, or folder, is the same one that this file browser here is showing. You can send commands to your operating system from here. For instance, if I wanted to list all the files, I could just run the command ls, which is short for list. And see how it shows my hello.py file? It's just like this file browser up here. It's the same folder, it's the workspace folder. So now that we're here at the command prompt, we can actually tell the Python interpreter to run our script. Now you do this by typing Python, followed by a space, and then your script name, which our script name is hello.py. Here we go. And now you'll see the output, hello world indeed. Wow, that was a whole bunch of new information, right? Nice job immersing yourself. We'll talk about all of these terms again throughout the course, but let's do one more run through of what just happened. So we have a file browser over here and it's showing the files from the workspace directory, which is the same directory in our terminal session. And from the command line here, we can call the Python interpreter by typing Python, and then we pass our file named hello.py to it. In our code editor here, we see a single line of code and it's syntax highlighted. That line of code is calling the print function, which is being passed a string, hello world. This line, when evaluated, will write out that string to the terminal. Awesome. Glad you got a chance to hang out in Workspaces. It's a super handy tool. Remember, you can get the Python interpreter installed on your computer and run things there, but let's not focus on that just yet. Let's get you coding first. We've only read existing code. You haven't even written your own yet. Let's change that. Ooh, I know, let me show you a cool feature of the Python interpreter. It has an interactive mode where we can type Python and it evaluates immediately. Let's go do that right after this quick break. We just saw how to pass a script to the Python interpreter. Another way to use the interpreter is in a more exploratory, interactive way. You can actually open up a prompt that allows you to type Python code line by line. 
Now this is super handy when you just wanna see what some code does, not actually go and create a whole script. This type of interactive programming prompt is pretty popular in a lot of other languages. Generically, this type of exploratory prompt is referred to as a REPL, or R-E-P-L, which stands for Read, Evaluate, Print, Loop, which is basically what its role is. It reads the line, it evaluates it, it prints the result, and then it loops back so you can add another line of code. Python's REPL is often referred to as the Python shell. It is a wonderful place to hang out as you are learning, so I definitely want you to be familiar with it. Come on, let's go explore. So to open up the REPL, we simply type Python. And we'll get some information about the version of Python that we're running. So we're running 3.6.4 on Linux. Remember, your workspace is running the Linux OS, or operating system. These three greater than signs, or chevrons as they're sometimes called, are communicating to us that this is the place where we can write some code. So let's do it. Since we know we have a working program up here, let's just write that out ourselves. So we want to make sure that we type it exactly like it is above. Make sure that you keep everything lowercase. Case matters in Python. So this print is different than this lowercase print. So that's the name of the function that we want to call. And you call a function using parentheses. So, and now we want to pass in a string. And uh, we can create a string using quotation marks. So we'll do that, open that up, and then our characters, which here happens to be hello, comma, space, world. And then we close our string with another quotation mark. And then finally, we, we close our function call with a closing paren. So let's go ahead and run that. Awesome. Hello, world. So now a great thing about the shell is that it keeps its history. If you press the up arrow, you can get the last line that you just typed back. This is handy if you had made a typo or you want to write a line that is very similar. Like, for instance, let's make this just say hello to you. So I'm going to put my name in here. Hello, Greg. Awesome. Now, Python shell is also a pretty good calculator. You can use it to do math-like things, like things like uh, 1 plus 2. And so you'll see here that the result printed out three. Note that we didn't actually call the print function. Now this is a good example of the REPL in action. What happened was it read the line one plus two, it evaluated it, what's one plus two? And then it printed the result, three, and it looped back to the prompt. It showed the result so that we could see it. We'll get to some more math in the course in just a bit. Now another thing that is wonderful about the Python prompt is that you can get help when you need it. So for instance, if we wanted to know more about the print function, we could just call the help function. So we say help, and we pass in the function that we're interested in. We're interested in print. Let's see what happens. So this kicks open the documentation for the print function. Now this is gonna have some terminology in here that we haven't yet covered, so don't let that overwhelm you. Now, believe it or not, if you stick with it and immerse yourself, this will all make sense. We'll get to all of this, just not right now. So here's the description. It prints the values to a stream or sys.standardout by default. Standard out is another way of saying the place that you ran the program from, the default output. So basically what this is saying is that we could print to other places too. This value here is the hello world string that we passed in. Then you'll notice that there's a comma and then there's these ellipses. There's these three ellipses here, right? So this means that we could actually pass multiple values to print. And we'll do that here in a bit. We'll, we'll pass multiple values. Now, if you look down at the bottom here, you'll see that it says end. And that's because we're inside of what is known as a pager. When help opens, it does that. Now, it just so happens that all the help fits on one page. But let's go ahead and let's make that not happen. So this is something you can do too. You can make the console bigger or smaller. So I'm going to make it smaller. And you'll see what happens is eventually there's this like blinking colon. And I wanted to show you this just in case you opened up help to something else. You can press the up and down keys and move around and spacebar actually moves a page at a time. So to get out of a pager, what you can do is press Q. And now normally what would happen when you popped out of here is you would pop back into your shell, but it looks like I had a little bit of a workspace problem, which is I'm glad happened so I can show you what to do when this happens. So the console, you can restart your console always by clicking either this X here. This will close the console. And I can come up here and I can say view show console. And when it should pop back open, there we go. And so if we were inside of a shell, you might want to know how to get out of here too, right? So there is a handy function called exit. 
and that will pop you out. But even better, and I know because we programmers are lazy, you can also press Control D to drop out of there. There we go. Awesome. So now you have a place to go and explore when you need to. Also, you can't break anything in there, so feel free to do whatever. And like you just saw, you can always exit out. A common thing that happens to people just beginning to learn to code is that they're afraid to make mistakes, so they freeze up. Please don't be afraid of making mistakes. That will bite you in the future. Try to change your point of view to this one. Making mistakes is awesome. Messing up simply means that you're trying, and you can't learn without trying, can you? So don't let those mistakes get you down. It's part of the learning process, and the REPL is awesome for that kind of exploration. I do get it, though. Those error messages can be intimidating. So let's do this. Let's take a quick break and then take a look at some of the more common errors and how to handle them. I've got some bad news for you. You aren't perfect. Nobody is. You're bound to make a mistake when you're coding. And even though we just agreed that making errors is a good thing, it can still feel a little overwhelming. Part of the reason for this is that you don't yet know the rules of the language. These rules are called syntax, and I can pretty much guarantee you're going to make a syntax error. In fact, It'd be super weird if you didn't. So let's do this. Let's force some errors and then walk through the fixes together. This error fixing skill will help assist you as you pick up the syntax of the language. Okay, so let's launch your workspace. So remember when I said that case matters? So this function name here, print, let's capitalize that P. Now, one nice thing that just happened, did you notice how the color changed? So see, there's regular P, it's red. Here's capital P, blue. Our editor knows about the print function. Note, when I change the file, there is a little orange dot up here. Do you see that? That's letting me know that the file has been edited, but not yet saved. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to save this file. You come in here and you choose save, and you can see that I'm on a Mac. So this is the sign for command S. So I believe on a Windows, it's control S. So you can go ahead and click save, and now you see the dot is gone. I want to make you aware of this totally common problem. So you write amazing code, and you forget to save it. And then by pure instinct, you just smack your face on the keyboard trying to figure out why your script isn't working the way that it says it's supposed to be working, and it's all because you forgot to save. And sometimes you even luck out and your nose hits the command key and your brow hits the S and you fix your problem, but that's rare. So mind the dot. So. Since case matters, we know that lowercase print is different than this capital P print. But let's keep this here. Let's see what happens when we run it. So again, we're gonna come down here and we're gonna say Python, and we're gonna call hello.py. Yikes, what's that? Oh, that's right, we made this happen on purpose. So this is what is known as a traceback, and it helps you follow or trace the path in the code that caused the problem. Kind of makes you feel like a detective, right? Trace down that uh, perpetrator. Now, we only have a one-line script, so it's pretty clear where the error is, but these can get pretty big pretty quick. So what this is saying is that the file hello.py on line one, and if you look up here, there's these line numbers in the gutter. So if you come here, you can see that I can add new line numbers there, and they, they go up, so that will help you find those. I'm gonna get rid of those. So we've got an error in line one, and if you come down to the very bottom, you'll see the error. And we have a name error. And here it says that the name print, with the capital P notice, uh, is not defined. So name here is the name of the function, print. We'll learn here in a bit how to define our own names. Basically, the interpreter here is saying, what you talking about? Now, there isn't anything defined as capital P print. Remember, case matters. Capital P print and lowercase print are different. Different keystrokes for different folks. So let's fix this. Let's go ahead, come up here, change this back to lowercase p. Ah, there we go. Back to red. All right. So this print function here is called. I briefly explained earlier that you call a function by providing an open parenthesis and a closing parenthesis. Now note here, if I put my cursor at the opening parenthesis or the closing parenthesis, it will highlight, it will, it'll show me how they're balanced. And it is important that they're balanced. It's part of the syntax of the language. The syntax states that for a function that an opening parenthesis and everything in between it 
and the closing parenthesis are arguments. So what happens if we forget the trailing parenthesis? Let's go ahead and get rid of that. So this is invalid syntax, right? Where would the function call actually end now? It doesn't, right? So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna save this. See the red dot? Now the red dot's gone. So I'm gonna come down uh, back to my terminal and the terminal actually has history as well. And I can use the up arrow and we'll run Python hello pi. File hello pi line two. What? what? There's only one line. So we have here a syntax error. Unexpected EOF while parsing. Now, parsing is the way that the interpreter breaks down what you wrote into something that it understands. It had a problem understanding us because we didn't follow the rules of the language. Now, if you don't know what EOF means, and you probably don't, what would you do? Well, what do you do these days when you don't know what a term means? What do you do? Yeah, that's right. You just ask Google or you ask Alexa or whoever your preferred oracle is. Just go over there. I'm going to use Google for right now. Oh, hi, Maya. So we'll say, what does EOF stand for? In computing, end of file, commonly abbreviated EOF is a condition in a computer operating system where no more data can be read from the data source. End of file. Well, that makes sense. It reached the end of the file without finding the closing paren. I want to reiterate here that you are never alone in your errors. Millions of people are coding and making mistakes. You'll find answers to their questions if you just search for them. The internet is pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, for course-specific things, remember that there's a wonderful community here to ask, and you can also search the archives of questions and answers. So let me point out one more common gotcha before we get cooking. This is one that happens all the time. So in Python, you can make a string just like we did here with double quotes, or you could also use, I'm going to put this print back, you could also use single quotes. So this is also valid, single quotes. It really is just a question of style. Often though, the error that happens is that there is a mismatch. One single quote and one double quote. Now let's do that. One single quote and we'll trail it with a double quote. Now a careful look at that closing paren will show you the problem. Notice how when it's correct, it's black. And when it's not, it's that teal color, the same color as our string. Now that's because the string hasn't been ended yet. It's waiting for us to finish with a single quote. And it's totally fine to have a quote and a paren in a string. So there, if I put that in, that's valid, right? But since there is no closing single quote, they're part of the unclosed string. So let's go ahead, let's, let's make our error happen. I'm gonna save this. And I'm gonna type clear down here because that will clear the console stuff that's there. And I'm gonna press up and get python hello.py. Here we go, we got a syntax error and we have EOL, which is end of line while scanning the string literal. And you can see that there is an arrow here actually pointing to where it expected the ending of the string. Now this is where you want to really inspect closely, almost character by character. I want you to hone your inner detective. Aha, elementary dear Watson, mismatched quotes. I hope you now feel a little more prepared for when you encounter those errors, and you will. Don't let them get you down. When you see those tracebacks, try to remind yourself, hey, look at me, I'm learning. And with that confidence, let's get to writing some code. That is, right after you take a quick break. Now, taking breaks is super important for your learning. You'll thank me later. A lot of information just went into your brain. Let it sink in. Give a nice stretch, grab a snack, pet your cat, water your plants, refill your coffee, or whatever it is that you like to do when you're taking a break. It doesn't have to be long. Come back refreshed and ready to name some things because that's what's up next, creating variables. So you know that hello world string that we used in our hello.py file? To be a little bit more specific, we created a new string. We did that creation by surrounding our text with quotation marks. This is what is known as a string literal. Now we currently don't keep that string around. We create it, we use it in our print statement, and then we let it go. But we could actually store it and use it later. In the real world, we create things and store them for later use all the time. 
Here's an example I can think of right now. Actually, I can't stop thinking of, probably because it's about lunchtime. Last night I made some delicious tacos. So good, in fact, that I wanted to bring them into work today. So I grabbed a food storage container, you know, some Tupperware, and I put the remainder of the delicious meat in it. When I put it in the refrigerator here at the office, I decided that I had better label it, mostly so people knew it was mine. Putting a label on it ensures that no one is just going to throw my food away. Also, I know it's mine. We have a lot of other labeled Tupperware in our fridge. Labeling it helps me find my food. Now here's a little confession. I end up making a lot of tacos, and I end up keeping a bunch of leftovers. And the problem that leads to is this. If I just label this with my name, I don't actually remember what is in the Tupperware. Now one way I get around that is by adding another label to it. This one is beef, this one's chicken, some carnitas, and this one is something. So there are two of these labels referring to the same object. In Python, everything you create is an object, and you can label an object so that you can refer to it later in your program. These labels that you create are called variables. Variables allow you to refer to objects that have been created. They are object references. Now let's launch your workspace and take our example from Tupperware to software. Okay, it's time to make this code a little more personal. Let's change this so it says hello to you. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna change this to be my name. I'm gonna type Craig and you should type your name there. And now let's go ahead and add another print statement and this time write it about yourself. So we'll do print, call the function and we'll say Craig is learning Python. Now let's go ahead and run the script again. That's Python and then you can type the start of your file name, and then you can press tab and it will complete it for you. Nice, right? Awesome. Now, what if I asked you to change who this program was addressing? Like instead of you, some other clever person. Ooh, I know. Let's change this to greet the very first computer programmer, Ada Lovelace. She published the first algorithm for a device called the analytical engine in the 1840s. Pretty clever is putting it lightly. Check the teacher's notes for more. So now I know you could very easily just go and replace your name with Ada's, but let's do something a little more clever than that. How about we create a new string with her first name in it, and then we store it. So we could use it later in these lines, right? These lines here, we can use it here and here. So you know how to create a string already. You just surround some text with quotes. So we'll put Ada's name in there, Ada. So that creates a brand new string object. That's a string literal. And we want to keep this around. So we need to give it a label or a name. So let's see, how would we like to refer to this string? What's a good name for it? Well, it is a first name. So let's call it that. Now, there are some naming rules that I've added to the teacher's notes, but the most important one is that there can't be spaces in a variable name. So if we say first, and I wanted to call this, I'll move her over here. So we wanted to say first, and then this is where I would say first space name if I was just naming something. But we can't have spaces in a variable name. So what you do is where you would normally put a space, you use an underscore. So we'll put underscore, and that's next to the zero key on your keyboard. I know that's the one that you probably don't use very often. And then you put the next word, so name. And you assign the object to the label using the equal sign. This is called assignment. So the string Ada is assigned to the first name variable. And now the first name variable refers to this string object that we created, Ada. So let's use it. Well, one thing to notice is that we've kept the variable name all lowercase. Remember, case matters, and it makes a difference in your variable names as well. We follow the typical Python naming convention. You keep your variable names lowercase and you use underscores to separate words. Fun fact, this naming style is often called snake case. More in the teacher's notes. So. First name is our string, right? So we should just be able to use it. So let's see, if I come in here and I just say print first name, let's go see. So I'm gonna use the up arrow, let's see what that did. We should see Ada and then hello Craig. Awesome, it's right there. So 
In order to fix these other statements, we're going to first explore a little something about the print function. So the print function as we've used it is just taking a single argument, right? We're just, we're just giving it one argument here. Well, it actually takes multiple arguments. Remember when I talked about the ellipses just briefly when we looked at that help documentation? So what happens is that each value that you add to the print function is printed one after the other, separated by spaces, by default. Like this, here, here, check this out. So if we come in here and we say print, and I'm just gonna create a string called these. And then I'm going to add a new argument. And I do that by typing a comma. And now I'll type a new string. Let's say uh, will be, and I'm gonna close that string. And then I'll do one more. So we can see that there's just another argument with a comma and joined together by spaces. So if I'm gonna save that, and if I just run that one more time, we'll see each of these strings, one after the other, separated by spaces. So let's go ahead and rewrite this line first so that we can see them next to each other, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and give ourselves some space here and I'll say uh, print. And I want the first part to be the same. I want that hello, that's, that's kind of gonna be the same no matter what. We'll say hello, comma, but now I want to end my string. And then we want to show our first name. So we're gonna do a comma. See how there's a, there's a comma in the string, but there's also a comma on the outside here. So, cause that's separating our arguments. So we're gonna add our next argument. We'll do first name. And then we'll close the function call. So we should see, hello, Craig, hello, Ada. And we do, awesome. So let's get rid of some of these other lines. So I'm gonna come here and in the edit menu, if you come here, you can see that there is a delete line, which is shift command D on a Mac. I believe it's probably shift control D on Windows. So I'm gonna go ahead and press that. You'll see the line went away, but if I come here and I do shift command D, it goes away. Now, if you mess that up, there is always edit undo and it will come back, right? And that's that was edit undo is command Z and there's a redo shift command Z. So if I press uh, command Z, it'll go away and shift command Z, they'll go away again. Cool. So let's rewrite this learning Python using our variable, just like this is. So we'll say print. And actually, why don't you go ahead and give that a go? Why don't you make that line, use our variable so that it says Ada is learning Python. Pause me and try to finish the line. When you're done, unpause me and I'll show you how I did it. Now don't worry, you won't break anything, remember? Ready? Pause me. So how'd you do? Here's what I did. I used our variable first, right? So I said first name, and then I wanted to add another argument, so I typed a comma, and then the remainder of the string. Now I'm lazy, so I just copied this, came like this, and I did copy, and I pasted it. Close that string here at the end, and close the call. There we go, and if we come down here, we can clear this. We press up a couple times, there we go. Ada is learning Python. I bet she loved Python. One final thing that I'd like to point out about our variable is that you can actually label any object. So let's do this. Let's assign the variable first name a number. So like, let's say uh, 11, All right? So now we go and we run it, and it says 11 is learning Python. Not a common name, but I've seen stranger things. 11 would love Python too, I'm pretty sure. Aren't you glad that we stored that object for later use? It's just like those leftovers. Mm. Oh, that reminds me, I'm gonna go retrieve my tacos from the fridge by using the label. After this delicious break, we'll talk about how to add a little interactivity to our script. Taco to you soon. So far, what we have done is all output. We print to the screen. It's not very interactive, is it? Conversation's kind of one-sided. Now, take a second and think about applications that you use. Just about every one of them gathers information from you, whether that be a field or a checkbox, a button click, or telling a bird when to flap its wings. Every application you make is going to need to gather some information from its users. This is called input. And gathering input from users from the command line is pretty straightforward, so let's get to it. 
So let's explore this input thing a little bit in the Python shell first. So I'm going to open that up. We'll type Python. Let's give ourselves a little bit of space. All right. So the command to get input from the user is super easy to remember. It's input. So input, that's a function. So we're going to call it. And inside here, you put the prompt. So let's ask a question. So uh, we'll say, how are you today? So see how the cursor is here? It's waiting for me to type. So how am I? Uh, great. I mean, you're standing a little close to me, but pretty great. Already we're seeing the importance of user experience, right? That prompt made me feel uncomfortable. So I'm going to press enter. And now remember, in the REPL, we see the results show up. So what happens is when you call the input function, it outputs out the prompt, and then it waits for an answer. Once the answer to the prompt is given and the user presses enter, the result is returned. So we know that this input returns a string. So let's capture it in a new variable. So let's see, what would how are you today be? Uh, hmm. I guess that'd probably be something like current mood, right? Naming things is hard, isn't it? So so we do current, and then we're going to use the underscore because there's two words, right? So current mood, that's current mood in snake case. And we'll say, uh, again, we do the input. How are you today? Now, you know what? I'm going to use a couple of spaces just to give some room there for, for user experience. So let's do this. So uh, How are you today? Well, I am wonderful, especially now that you're not standing so close to me. And now our variable, current mood, if we just type that out here, we can see what's in it. Wonderful. Awesome. So you know what? We could just put this in our program. We could ask for the user's first name. So let's do it. So we'll just replace this value with the input statement. We'll say, what is your first name? And then we'll definitely give them some space because we want them to feel comfortable. Awesome. So now... You know what else? Let's let's scroll this down. Let's get rid of these other lines in here where we're saying hello. So I'm going to Command Shift D that and Command Shift D this and let's bring this back up. There we go. That's looking good and it's saved. So let's go ahead. I'm going to drop out of the shell. Control D. I'm going to clear the console and I'm going to type Python hello.py. So what is your first name? Well, hmm. I just got an email from one of my students, so he's on my mind right now. So I'll enter K Hinde. Hello, K Hinde. K Hinde is learning Python. How's the weather in Nigeria this time of year, K Hinde? And so you'll see that the first name variable is now set to whatever we enter from input. So the program changes based on our user's input, which is awesome because now we're dealing with input and output, the staples of application development. Great job we stumbled right into a fundamental problem that you're going to encounter daily in your coding journey. Naming things is hard. Now, you'll get better at it, but it's never easy. And I can't stress this enough. A good name is really important. You want to be able to look at your code and understand and remember what it's doing. You want to be able to read it next week. Now, one thing to remember, and most people who are just getting started coding don't think about this too often. Other people are going to read your code. Now, that might seem like a totally foreign idea, but ready for this? You're going to be most likely on a team, and your teammates will need to understand what you are trying to communicate. We already know that the computer has rules for understanding what we're talking about, right? That's called syntax. But what we're talking about here is coding style. There is absolutely nothing stopping you from using a single letter variable name for the current mood code that we wrote. Like I could store the result from the prompt, how are you today, in a variable called m. But I can guarantee that your actual real life mood is going to change for the worse when you read this code and have to try to figure out, what does m mean? Great news though, the Python community as a whole are very big on consistent style. Chances are, after you learn the style rules, your code will be indistinguishable from that of a longtime Python coder. I'll point these standard style decisions out as we encounter them. The one we've seen already is use snake case for variable names. Now, it's definitely not a syntax error. You could use another casing system. Like, for instance, you could say current mood. This is called camel case, 
each word here has a new hump. This is an example of what camel casing looks like. If you're working with a team on a project, you'll want to make sure that you follow the same style that is being used in the project. Try to stay consistent. So, how are you feeling? You've picked up quite a bit of information over these past couple of videos. I know that it's a lot, especially if this is your first language. So let me say again, great job sticking with it. What you've been learning will give you a great foundation to dive deeper and explore the language. We've got the starts of what every application has, input and output. Next up, let's start processing that input that we receive right after this quick break. We've seen how Python can work with different types of information, right? Like for instance, so far we saw strings and we also saw how we could work a bit with numbers. Now, those are definitely different types of information. The more common way you'll hear this information referred to is with the term data. So these different types of data are called data types. Earlier, I showed off a little bit of how to work with numbers, or rather numeric data. Let's pop open the Python shell and dive a little deeper into our exploration. So let's go ahead and open up that REPL. So we do that by typing Python. I'm gonna scroll this up so we get some more space. Okay, so whole numbers like one are called integers. And they're whole because they aren't fractional, meaning they don't have a decimal point. So we can add one plus two. And integers are also called ints for short, I-N-T, int. And we could subtract using the minus key. So we do three minus two, and we'll see that we get one. Now, integers can also be negative. So we can say five minus seven, and that will give us a negative two. And we can multiply by using the asterisk. So four times two is eight. A handy trick that I'd like to show while we're here is that there's a magic variable in the REPL that always gets set to the result of each one of these statements. It's stored in the underscore. So for instance, this eight that was just returned, it's actually in the variable underscore eight. You'll thank me later when you need that. So let's take a look at what happens when we use a decimal point now. So let's add four and we'll do one and a half, so 1.5. Now note that this returned 5.5. This result is not an integer. Integers are whole numbers. This has a decimal point. This is a different data type. It's known as a floating point number or float for short. Now we always will get a float when we do division. We'll always be returned a float. So watch, this is 16 divided by four, and you'll see that we got 4.0. Floats are required when we need more precision. That precision, however, comes with the need for some caution. As you'll see here, you can do math with floats, just like we were doing with ints. So we can say 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1, and we get 0 0.2. But you need to be careful. Here, watch this example. So I'll use the history. We'll get back 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1. I'm gonna add one more. So just, you can chain values like that. You can keep on adding. So we get 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1. So that should be 0 0.3. And if we subtract 0 0.3, watch what happens. And we get back five and some change, which is weird, right? Because that should be zero. But really, if you look at the end here, this is exponential right here. This is an exponent of negative 17. So this is actually 5.5 raised to the negative 17th power. So this is really 0 point and then 17 zeros and then a 5, which is more or less 0, right? If you want to bring a floating point number back to an integer, you can round it to the closest integer using, quite intuitively, a function named round. So we'll say round, and I don't want to type that. Oh, I can use the underscore. So we'll say that. So that will be rounding of the 5.55, blah, 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 blah. So here we go. Zero. Awesome. So I'm going to do a control L here. Uh, that's going to bring us back up to the top. Okay, so here we go. So in case you've forgotten about rounding, if the fraction portion is more than half, it'll roll up. So we'll say round will be 4.6. So that should round to five, and it does. And if it's below half, so we'll say 4.2, that will round down. Awesome. 
Now, these rounding errors have been a plot point in several movies about computer programmers. My favorites include Office Space, where the rounding errors were sending fractions of a cent to Samir and Michael Bolton's bank accounts. And then the amazing Richard Pryor, prior to that, uh, pulled a similar clever stunt in Superman 3. Now, this points out that floats and their precisions make them not the most ideal type to deal with currency. There are Python data types and various methods that help to make sure that we don't let this movie plot disaster happen to the software you create. There's more in the teacher's notes. Now, you might remember from your math class, whenever that might have been, that there's an order of operations, and that holds true here too. So we've got this P-E-M-D-A-S, or please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. That's what my uh, junior high math teacher used to say. So shout out to Mr. Beetle. That one's been stuck in my head since seventh grade. The operations work in that order. Now, first, it's any P, which is parentheses, and then it's E for exponents, M for multiplication, then division, addition, subtraction. Now, there's more in the teacher's notes if you feel like you need a refresher. Let's just go ahead and create some random equations. So uh, let's do 10 minus 3 times 5 plus Eight. So, here, using the order of operations, the multiplication would happen first, right? So, uh, there's no parentheses, there's no exponents, there is an M, so that would happen first, and then division, and then addition, then subtraction. So, what we have here is we have 15, and we have 10 minus 15, negative 5, plus 8 is 3. Awesome. But that's probably not that obvious if you don't remember the rules. So it's best to just be explicit in what you want, and Python lets you do that. So you can just use parentheses to group your ordering. Like let's say that we actually wanted to have 10 minus 3 first, so I could put that in parens, and then I wanted to multiply 5 plus 8. And that way we don't need to, I think that's more clear, right? So we have 10 minus 3, we have 7 times 5 plus 8 is 13, I'm going to go ahead and let that do it. It should be somewhere around 91. There we go. And you can see how that reads more clear, right? Especially the more time that you've spent away not doing math like this. Like, for instance, over the weekend, I was talking with my dad's sister, and she was saying how she forgot a bunch of this math knowledge. So I think that she's a really great example of how it would help her if you were just more explicit with your mathematical statements. I guess what I'm trying to say here is please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. It's been a while for her. Bam! Math teacher joke, Mr. Beetle would be so proud. Integers and floats working together is totally convenient because the types understand how to work together. But what happens if you try to do math operations with data types that just don't get each other? Well, we're here in the REPL, the place built for exploration, so let's just quench our thirst for knowledge by giving it a try. We're not going to break anything. So, let's take the string apple. We'll say apple. And I want it, well, that's not good. We want apple, and then I want to add two to that. So we get a type error, and it must be a string, not an int. And that's true even if the string looks like a number. So if we have 11 plus two, that's also a type error. Now, if you remember, our input function always returns a string. I sense that that's going to be a problem because I'm sure eventually we're going to want to prompt a user for a number, but we're going to get a string back. I'm going to control L to get back up there. There is a handy built-in function that lets you change or coerce into a different type. So if we want an integer, we just pass it our string like this. So we say int and we pass in our string. So our string 11 will come back and you'll see now it's an int. And there's also one for float. So if we could take a float and we can give it a string of 11, and you'll see it comes back with 11.0. Awesome. And you can also convert an existing integer to a float. So we'll just give it an 11 there, just straight 11, the number that's an integer, right? And now it becomes 11.0. And of course, there's the reverse. So if I say int 11.9, you'll see that we get back 11. Now, note, this didn't round. If it did round, it would be 12, right? It would round up. What this type of coercion does is it just forgets everything after the decimal point, which might be handy if you only want to work with integers. 
you can do something similar with what's known as the division shortcut. Remember, division uh, was a single forward slash. So if we said 23 divided by 3, and we'll see we get 7.6 and some change, right? That's a float. But if we use the double forward slashes, so if we say 23 slash slash 3, we'll get just the integer portion. So we'll get back 7. And if you wanted to get the remainder in integer form, you can do that too, using what is known as the modulus. So we'll say 23 modulo 3. So 3 goes in to 23 seven times, and 3 times 7 is 21, right? So 23 minus 21 is our answer too. So that's remainder math. More in the teacher's notes. That was a lot, right? Especially if you're like my Aunt Sally and it's been a while since your last math session. Now, don't fear though, a common misconception is that there is a ton of math in all of programming. Now, don't get me wrong, there are definitely heavy calculations required in a few business sectors, but you'll ramp up to those calculations as you need them. Now, if you're working on a shopping cart application, maybe you'll need some basic arithmetic, like quantity multiplied by the price of the product and then calculate tax and add a shipping charge. But those formulas, they're already established and you just need to make the code run through the proper equations. If this all feels overwhelming, don't worry. I'm gonna be walking you through some practical math examples in this course. You got this. Why don't we take a well-deserved break and then swing back and take a look at our next type, strings. I like to imagine a string just like a banner you might see at a party with each letter strung together. That's really what a string is, right? It's a series of characters. The string data type provides some very handy methods that I'd like you to get familiar with. After you create a string, it cannot be changed. This is what is known as immutable or impossible to modify. I'll remind you of this as we look at some of these examples. Why don't we pop open a shell and I can show you what I'm talking about. So, string literals, they can be made with either single or double quotes. And I can imagine that you might say something like this, you could say, I cannot understand why you need two options for quotes. Totally understand why you might say something like that. But that's probably a little bit formal, isn't it? We should probably use a conjunction. How about we say something like, I can't understand. Oh, oops, that's a problem, right? We've got a quote inside of the quote. We've got a single quote and we're trying to use a single quote. Uh-oh. Now, one option is that you can actually make it so the quote is ignored by doing something called escaping. So the backslash starts what is known as an escape sequence. So the backslash and then a quote basically tells the interpreter to treat that quote like a character instead of treating it like part of the syntax, right? So if I do can't understand, now we'll see, but I mean, this is kind of ugly, isn't it? This backslash T. Are you glad there's two types of quotes yet? Now, actually, look, the REPL fixed it. So you can use quotes like that. So if you use double quotes, then you could very easily use a single quote inside of it. Like so. Now we can say, I can't. Right? There's a nice string. And actually, escape sequences are great for adding blank lines inside of your string. So there's a special one that you'll see. If we come over here and we... We go up, let's get this I can't back here. Um, let's say I can't, and then we want to add a new line. And so that escape sequence to add a new blank line is backslash in for new line. So we'll add two, two blank lines, and we'll say I can't even. And the REPL here is playing tricks on us. Uh, it's trying really hard to keep things on one line for us. But actually, if you print that string, so we'll go ahead and we'll say print, and then we'll get back the result that was just there, right? So we'll use the underscore. So you'll see that it is actually, I can't new line, new line, even. There's our new lines. My wife says that to me all the time while shaking her head about my dad jokes. You're not the only one. I suppose I should quote her though, right? So I would say, she said, uh-oh, I can't. So now what? Now we've got a single quote and a double quote in here. Actually, Triple quotes allow you to start the string. So we could say, she said, I can't. 
And a nice thing about triple quotes is it allows you to have spaces in your string. So we can press like this and see those triple dots over there. That means it's waiting for me to, it's waiting for those final three quotes. So we can say, I can't even. So she said that. It's still, there's another quote there, right? So I'm, I'm ending that quote and then it's waiting for three, three quotes to end it. So there we go. And if I say, go up a couple times here, we say print. She said, I can't even. That's what she said. All right. So now that we got creation out of the way, let's look at combining some strings together. Like, what if I had a string like this word here, chocolate? Right? Now we can actually combine it together with another string using a plus sign. So I can say chocolate plus marshmallow. And you'll see what it returned was a brand new string with the two words pushed together. This is called concatenation. Now, it's important to remember when you're concatenating strings to include the proper spacing. Otherwise, it will be slammed together like this. So what we want is probably more like this. Chocolate plus space and marshmallows. There we go, that feels good. And of course, we can store that new string that was created in a variable, right? So we can say dessert. So we could say dessert equals chocolate plus and marshmallows. So that was a new string created and then we labeled it with dessert. And we can use that variable to create a brand new one. This is called reassigning. So we'll say dessert equals dessert plus uh, and graham crackers. And now that might look like we changed the variable dessert, but what happened was that this statement dessert plus and graham crackers created a new string and we removed our already existing label and put it on the new string. We reassigned it. The old string, since it didn't have a label, is essentially thrown away, like those leftovers in my office fridge. Remember, we didn't actually change the original string because we can't, right? And that's because strings are immutable. This appending of more text to the end of a string is pretty common. So there's a shortcut called in place addition. So if we say dessert, we can say plus equals. And basically that's just like the line above. It's saying dessert equals dessert plus, and then whatever we do. So we say plus equals yum. And if we take a look, chocolate and marshmallows and graham crackers, yum. So pff, that needs some exclamation points, am I right? And I want some more than just a couple. I don't wanna just add a whole bunch of them myself. I'd rather do that in code. So that's where the asterisk comes into play. So check this out. If I want to repeat the string, well, here's the string, exclamation point, I can then do a star for multiplication, and I say do that 20 times. Awesome. In addition to exclamations, this is really handy for trying to draw layouts in text. So let's append those. So we'll say dessert, and we'll do an in-place addition. So dessert, basically, that's dessert equals dessert plus, and we'll say uh, the exclamation point times 20, and there. We go. Now, before I append some more string information into your brain, let's take a quick break and return to talk some more about strings. We'll talk about various handy methods that a string provides. So let's start with a string variable. It is a quote from Albert Einstein, and it's a great one for encouraging exploration here in the REPL. So he said, a person who never made a mistake, never tried anything new. So there's a built-in function that lets you see the length of a string. You know, how many characters it contains? Its name is lin. So we'll play lin and then we'll pass in our object, our string object, we'll play lin quote. It has 58 characters and that includes spaces. So lin here, that's a function. Remember that everything you create is an object. So our string here that we created is an object and all objects can have abilities or methods. You can think of methods as functions that belong to an object. 
and you can access methods that an object owns by using what is known as dot notation. For instance, there's a great method on strings called upper. It creates a new string where all the characters in the original string are converted to uppercase. It's a good way to make the computer yell in all caps. And I can access the methods on a specific object, so let's use our quote object here, by placing a period after the variable name. Now this period here, this is why it's called dot notation. And now I can access the object's methods. So that method was upper. And it's just like a function. So I call it using parentheses. And this particular method, it doesn't take any extra argument. So we can leave the inside of this empty. And there you'll see we returned a new string of Einstein yelling motivation at you. And again, note, it didn't change the original string. And that's because you can't change a string. It returned a new string. So as you can imagine, there's also a method named lower that does a similar thing. And so the string owns the method lower and we access it by placing a dot. And then we do the method name, which was lower. And we call it, which the only character here that's different is that leading A. So this is Einstein whispering his advice to you. Now, if you're heeding his advice, I'd recommend that you pause me and attempt to use a method on the string called title. What it does is it turns all words in the quote to title case, meaning each word has a capitalized first letter. Go ahead and try it. Pause me. Are you ready? Here I go. This is what I did. I did quote, and then I did a dot to access its methods, title, and then I called it. So that could be the title of your autobiography. Am I right? You can also turn most objects into their string version using the built-in str, which is short for string. Now, this works the same way that we coerce strings to ints. It's just the reverse, right? So we could say str42, and we'll get back the string 42, not the integer 42. If you're curious to see what other methods a string owns, you can see them by doing help and then str. So you'll note we have methods defined here, and they're in alphabetical order. Now, these ones that start with these double underscores, these are known as magic methods. So let's skip past those for now. We've got plenty of magic already. So the first, keep on pressing space bar, it's jumping. So there we go. I think I saw the first one outside of there is capitalize. So here, this capital S represents our string. And you can see it's calling capitalize with no arguments because it doesn't take any. And it returns a new string. That's what this, this arrow means. It means it will return you a new string. And the instructions of what it says is it will return a capitalized version of S and make the first character have uppercase and the rest lowercase, which our string already does. Now, please don't feel like you should be able to read all this documentation right now. We'll get there. But you should be starting to recognize some words and concepts just like foreign language immersion. Isn't that kind of cool? Now, unfortunately, most documentation is not written with a beginner in mind, and some terms and knowledge are taken for granted. But hey, that's what we're here for, right? We'll get you reading this type of documentation in no time. Keep immersing yourselves. Okay, now press Q to drop out of the help documentation. And I'd like to show off a pretty handy feature of strings that you'll use quite a bit. It's called string formatting. And it allows you to create a reusable template that can be populated with different data. Think of these kind of like a mail merge. For instance, let's build one for an email subject for Treehouse students. The email subject, when populated, would probably look something like this. We'll say, thanks for learning JavaScript with us. Craig. So that's just one of the topics that we teach is JavaScript. So what we could do is we could define a template just like this for all topics and for all students, and all we would have to do is just switch out the variables. So what you do is you create a variable. We'll call it subject template, and we'll make it so we can reuse this later. And now this could be named anything. Don't worry about subject template. And what happens is you put your string, you want your, your template, so we say thanks for learning, and then when you want to replace something, you add a placeholder. And those look like this. It's an open curly bracket and then a closed curly bracket. So thanks for learning placeholder 
with us. And then we're going to also change the name out. We're going to put another placeholder. So we'll do an open curly bracket, close curly bracket, and we'll do an exclamation point. Close that. So now that we have a template, we can fill it with data. So we're going to use the format method on strings. It is a method that they own. Subject template dot format. And the way that this works is you put in the first parameter will replace the first placeholder and the second one will replace the second placeholder. So the first parameter that we want to push in, we want to say, thanks for learning Python with us. And so Python is the topic and Valentina is the name that we'll use here. Thanks for learning Python with us, Valentina. Awesome, right? And you can keep using different strings, right? So here we also teach Java. Somebody that I appreciate on our team here. We have, thanks for learning Java with us, Chad. Awesome, right? Now, numbers will automatically be coerced. For instance, if we had a purchasing screen, like something like said, you just bought, and then we put a placeholder for the number of items, and then we put a placeholder for what the item was. So we say, you just bought, now we'll do dot format, and we can pass in three and fidget cubes. And there you see, you just bought three fidget cubes. See how the three was automatically coerced to a string? But wait, there's more. One more powerful feature of strings is that you can check to see if one string is contained in another. Now, you can do this with the keyword in. It ends up reading very clear. So for instance, if you want to see, is there ham in hamster? It returned true. This is saying that this expression is true with a capital T. It is true that the word ham is actually in hamster. And the reverse is also true. Is the word popcorn in hamster? It's false. And you can see that, right? It's returned us back a false with a capital F. Now, these true and false values are actually a different data type that we should explore. These are called Booleans. It's true that we're about to tie up this string exploration. So take a quick break and then come back refreshed, ready to dive into Booleans. A Boolean data type only has two valid values, true and false. These values are gonna be used heavily in the code that we create from here on out. There are many times where we'll wanna ask a yes or no question and then run different code based on how the question's answered. Booleans are named after their creator, a mathematician named George Boole. In George's algebra, he used ones to represent the value true and zeros to represent false. And this is the reason you see actors playing hackers in movies dealing with ones and zeros. There's a popular saying in this world that says it's all ones and zeros. And that's because it is. Electrical circuits used in the computer that you're using right now are using Boolean values, on or off, true or false, one or zero. So they seem pretty important to get a handle on, right? We should explore these, true or false. The answer is true. There are only two Boolean literals, true and false. A variable can refer to the Boolean result in an expression, like our in keyword. For, for instance, has taco equals, uh, is taco in catacombs? You'll see that that was stored, has taco, we stored true in there. And just like our other data types, you can actually coerce values to be true or false. It's called bool. And then as you probably guessed, bool of one is true. And of course, bool of zero is false. Now, here's something that might surprise you. In addition to being the answer to the meaning of life, 42 is also true. In fact, any non-zero number is true and zero is false. So what happens with a string? So if I say, what's the Boolean of burrito? Now, I guess speaking personally in the statement, I want a burrito is always gonna return true, but that's not why this is true. What's happening here is any object that isn't empty is true. Now, empty is an interesting concept that we haven't talked about just yet. So a string literal is a pair of quotes surrounding a character, right? But what if there aren't any characters in there? Now this is known as an empty string. And as you can see, 
it's false. This emptiness is false tends to be a common confusion point for developers. So I want to introduce you to another term. The way in which a value coerces to a Boolean also has a name. It's truthy or falsy. So for instance, I can say that empty string is falsy and the number seven is truthy. I know it sounds like I made that word up, but I assure you it's real and you'll see it and hear it used. I guess it's slightly better than saying it's truish or falseish. So all that to say, emptiness is falsy. <laughs> that sounds like the name of an emo band. I'd like to introduce you to a couple of keywords that you already know and use in real life. You are about to see some of the beauty of Python's readable syntax. So if I wanted to negate a Boolean value, you know, get the opposite of the value, I can use the not keyword. So I can say not true. And it says false. Neat, right? And if I say not false, we'll see that that's actually true. So next up, you can actually chain together Booleans using the keyword and. So if we say true and true, we see that that's true. The way that and works is that both Booleans on both sides of the and must be true. So you can keep chaining them together too, and it works just like order of operations in our math examples. It goes from left to right. So if I say true and true and true, we get back true. But what happened was it checked this true and true, and that returned true. So that true, the result of this was checked against this true and true, and both sides were true. So therefore it's true. But if we come and we slap a false at the very end and false, we'll see that it's false because all of this became true. And then we had true and false and both sides must be true in order for and to return true. And it wasn't, so it returned false. So ors work a little bit different. If either value on either side of the keyword or is true, it's true then. Both ands work with both and ors work with either. So if it's false or true, we're gonna end up with true because there's one true. But if we have false or false, it's gonna be false because nothing's true. You can chain ors together too. And you can also use parens just like we did with our math to help it be more specific about the order of what's happening. So let's just go ahead, let's build something random. We'll say false or false or true and true and false. Okay, so let's walk through it before we press enter here. So two falses or together, that's a false. And so we have a false or true. One of those is true, so we have a true. So we have true and, and true and false. This is a false. So we have true here and we have false over here because not both of these are true. So we have a false and a true, that should be, false because both sides need to be true. And remember, we can always negate. We come in here, we can say, and not. Now you'll see that it looks like I typed over the front. This is a bug that sometimes happens in uh, the REPL. So I'm gonna press uh, space bar, even though that looks wrong, watch. Press enter, it came true. If we look at it, there it is. So we have false or false or true and not and so that negated this last one here. So this not true or false, true and false was false, not false is true. I know that this is all a little bit abstract. So let's try to make this a little more concrete. Let's think about a dating app and let's try to imagine some code that might exist there. So Heidi has some kids and she'd like to find someone who has kids too, but she can't stand smoking. She abhors it. So let's fill out a profile for a parent on the site who's also a smoker. So is smoker equals true. And they're a parent, so has kids equals true. So Heidi's requirements look like this. She says, I want somebody who's a parent, so he has kids and is not a smoker. So we have in this particular situation for her requirements, this profile here, we have has kids, that's true, and not is smoker, so that's false. So we have true and false, 
That's a false. That didn't work out. Heidi's going to swipe left. That just isn't the one for her, I guess. Here's hoping that she finds her. Do you see the power of Booleans? They can help you to find true love. Now, to really fall for Booleans, I'd like to show off the ability to run different blocks of code based on their value. This is called conditional branching. Let's branch off to that topic right after this quick break. Now that we can do some Boolean reasoning, we should look at how to use it to our advantage in scripts. We make choices all the time. If it's raining outside, I'm going to get an umbrella. If I'm hungry, I'm going to eat some food. If it's late and I'm tired, I go to bed. Well, unless I'm stuck on a coding problem that I just have to fix. I should always go to bed at that point. The answer usually comes in my sleep. All those scenarios start with the word if. And that is the first way that we are going to control the flow of our application. If you want to learn more, keep watching this video. In our script here, we ask for a name, we say hello, and then we say the person is learning Python. That's not always necessarily true, is it? So let's do this to fix it. If the name inputted is actually your name, then we'll print that message. So in order to do that, we're going to need to check and see if two values are actually equal. You can compare two objects using the double equal sign. Let's take a look real quick in, in the shell. So here's an example. We'll say fruit equals apples. And so we've assigned apples to fruit with a single equal sign, and then we'll check equality by using the double equal sign. So we'll say fruit, does that equal apples? True. And then if we compare apples to oranges, which you're not supposed to do, you get back false. And that's because fruit is apples, and apples do not equal oranges. So note how the single equal sign is used for assignment, and the double equal sign is used for comparison. Accidental assigning by using just a single equals is a super common problem. And that's probably because when we say fruit equals oranges in English, not fruit equals equals oranges. So when comparing, make sure that you double check for double equals. So in our code, we want to only show the learning Python bit if it's us. So I'm going to add a new line here and start it with a new keyword that you haven't seen yet, and it's called if. So if, and then what follows next is an expression. So let's see, we have first name already. So if first name is equal to, note the double equals there, Craig, double check the double equals always. And then we add a colon, which is a new character for us. What happens is the colon opens up the body of our if statement. Now the body is what will run if this expression is true. The way that you group the code together that will run when the expression is true is by indenting each line. Now you can indent your code with a tab or a series of spaces. The only requirement is that all indentation in your file is exactly the same. As you can imagine, that might cause some problems. So in order to standardize that decision for you, there is a very strong movement to use four spaces to indent your Python code. So as you can see down here in the editor, this says we're going to use spaces instead of tabs. So we're going to use spaces. And then this two here is saying the number of spaces. And I just said that we want to use four. So I'm going to change the defaults to be four. Four spaces is the default in most text editors for Python. And now we've just changed ours. More in the teacher's notes. So you'll notice that when I press enter after this if statement, you'll see that the cursor is automatically indented to where the code should go. Here, you'll see that we are on line four, which is true, line four, and we're in column five, which is four spaces, right? There's four blank spaces, and then we start writing. Awesome. But Actually, what we really want is this line here, right? We want, we want this line here up there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move to the front of this, and I'm going to press backspace, and you'll see that it automatically indented into our if block there. You can finish this grouping, or block of code as we call it, block. You can end that by going back to the original indentation level. 
So if we come to the end here and we press enter, it's waiting for us there. I can press backspace back here. So let's just add a new closing line so that we can see it. So we'll say print. We'll say have a great day. Ooh, let's use our format string. We'll use the name there one more time. And we'll say format, we'll pass in first name. Do you see how the indentation sh stops right here? It shows that this is clearly not part of the if statement. So let's run it and see if it's working. I'm gonna drop out of here. I'm gonna make sure that this is saved. There's no red mark up there. We'll say clear here. Let's go ahead and say python hello.py. Uh-oh, we've got an error. Let's see what's happening. Did you spot it? Unexpected end of file while parsing. So here we go. Look what I forgot. I forgot the final paren there. So there we go. So it was just waiting for us to finish. That's awesome. That's exactly the error I showed. See, it happens. Here we go. What is your first name? My name is Craig. And so there we see Craig is learning Python because it went into the if block and checked it. And now let's test the other side of it. Let's run it again without the name Craig or without, without, without your name. So how about my buddy Kenneth? He's a great teacher and Pythonista, and you'll meet him in a future course, I'm sure. Hello, Kenneth. Have a great day, Kenneth. So there we go. We don't have the output, Kenneth is learning Python, because our if condition here, right, this condition, first name equals Craig, Kenneth does not equal Craig. So that was false. You know what, though? I'm kind of feeling like everybody should probably start learning Python. I mean, don't you? So how about everybody that isn't you gets a message about learning Python? and this way, you could run it for your family or friends and give them a little motivation, you know, a little wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So you can very easily do this. And the keyword is else. So at the same indentation level as your if, you uh, use the keyword else and then a colon because else's also have bodies. So the next body of code and see how it's indented automatically there? We'll say print. You should totally learn Python, placeholder, exclamation point. Go ahead and close that string. We'll format, push in our first name, and then this time I'm going to remember to close my print statement. There we go. So what happens is we come in here, we check the first name. If this is true, this runs. Otherwise, this block runs. Do you see how the indentation really just makes the code kind of jut out? It's kind of like branches of a tree. This is why it's called branching. Now, this spacing that you see is also referred to as white space. One thing to do before we verify that this is working is to talk about our final branching keyword. It's one of the only Python keywords that isn't actually a word in English. It's called elif, and it's a combination of the words else and if. And what this allows you to do is chain different conditions. So let's do this. Now, I told you before that you're not alone in your journey. Your fellow students are taking this course right now. So let's go to the community and get some names. So here I am on the Treehouse site. It's most likely going to look different because we're constantly improving things. But up here in the header, there is a link to the community link. And this, by default, is all of the topics. But we can narrow that. So let's narrow that down here to Python. Let's take a look at this first one here. Is there a reason we are not setting the condition in the while statement? We're not quite there yet, but we're going to see that here in a second. So let's go here. Let's take a look at this. And this is Max Emilian. Let's grab, grab her name here. Let's say Max Emilian Quell, if I can. Max Emilia. So I'm going to copy that. And you'll see here she's gone and she's asked and she's put some, some questions in here. She got an answer back. And there's an answer there from Stephen Parker. And uh, she was told good job on, on what it was that she was asking. We'll get to this here just in a bit. So I'm going to pop back over and we're going to use Maximilian in our example here. So if it's me, we want to see this is learning Python. But uh, if it's specifically Maximilian, because we know she's in there, we'll say if first name equals, and I hope I'm saying her name right, Maximilian, maybe. Then we'll come in here and we'll say print first name is learning with 
fellow students community. You know what? Me too. And there we go. We added another branch. So let's go ahead and let's run it for Maximilian. That's going to be... First name is M-A-X-I-M-I. -I. Maximilian. Maximilian is learning with fellow students in the community. Me too. Cool, that's awesome that you're going to hang out there. Helping others is a wonderful way to make sure your learning sticks. I'm so proud of you. So, looking at the code, we see that it checks this if statement. Is Maximilian equal to Craig? That is not true. Else if Maximilian is equal to Maximilian, print this. And because that happened, we're not going to hit this otherwise block. So let's run one that does hit the otherwise block. Let's do that real quick. We'll say Python. And let's use one of our JavaScript teachers here, Treasure. And there it says, hello, Treasure. You should totally learn Python, Treasure. I think she is learning Python, actually. She's kind of a polyglot. She's, she talks a whole bunch of these different programming languages. So that equality comparison operator, the double equals, is just one of many ways that we can compare our objects. So if you would like to learn more about other comparison operators, then watch the upcoming video. Else if you are feeling like you want to check out the community forum, then you totally should. Else, you should take a break and then come back refreshed and ready to compare things. So we just picked up the ability to check out the equality between objects, the double equal sign, right? So let's explore some more comparison operations. Let's explore these in the shell first. So we'll say Python. Now to check and see if values are not equal, we use the exclamation mark and then equal sign. Right, so that exclamation mark there is sometimes called bang. You'll hear people say bang. So uh, bang equals is not equals. So hot dogs are not equal to sandwiches. True. Now, unfortunately, that's not solving the age-old debate. It's just saying that the strings aren't the same. Now, speaking of an age-old debate, my daughters are six and three. And you can use the greater than symbol to compare numbers. So six greater than three, true. And this confirms, much to the disappointment of my little one, that my eldest is indeed older. She's greater in age. And just to double check, we can do the reverse. Is uh, six less than three? I'm sorry, sweetie. So there will be cases where you'll want to check if a value is equal to or greater than another. So you can combine that with a pretty handy operator. You could say, is 42 greater than or equal to 42. And as you can see, it compares each of these operands. That's what these values are on both sides. They're called operands, and this they're being operated on by this operator. It says, are they greater than or equal to each other? Now, real quick, you can do this with strings as well. So uh, we can say, is sunshine greater than rain? Which is obviously true but that's not why it's returning true. This is doing alphabetical order. S comes after R, it's greater than R. So here's how I want to use our new comparison operators in our program. So what happened was I showed this program to my six-year-old and she put in her name and the program suggested that she start learning Python, which I obviously totally agree with, but she should really learn to read a little bit better before diving in. So let's do this. Assuming first name is an R name or our fellow student's name, we should ask for their age. So if it's less than or equal to, let's say, six, let's suggest that they learn to read first and then learn Python. So we can do that, right? Now, it might not be completely clear to you, but it's totally fine to nest an if statement. So let's do that. Let's come in here inside of our else here, right? So, so it's not us. It's not here. So... We don't know who they are. So let's go ahead and say age equals input. How old are you? And we'll give some space. And now remember that input always returns a string. But we actually need here, what we need is an integer because we're going to compare to it. So let's coerce what is returned into an integer. And you can do this. We can do this by wrapping it. We can say int. And then on this other end here, we can do this. So 
what's happening is we're coercing whatever is returned from here, which is going to be a string. So we're going to take the string and put it into here. That makes sense? So we only want to do this if they are less than or equal to six. So if age is less than or equal to six, I'm going to start my body and we'll say print. Uh, wow, you're like five, four, three, two. <laughs> if you're confident with your reading already, and then we'll just go ahead and say what we were going to say. Oh, we got to format this. We'll push in the age and that will automatically happen. I'm going to make sure that my I'm balanced there. Okay, great. And then other, so what's going to happen, they will only see this message if they're less than six, less than or equal to six. And then it will print, you should totally learn Python. Cool. So let's go ahead. Let's make sure that we save this. I'm going to come in here and drop out of the console. And then we'll clear and we'll say Python. Hello.py. So we'll run this with my daughter. Her name's Hattie. And hello, Hattie. How old are you? So awesome. We're in the else. We got a new input here. We'll put in six, which will be a string. I'll turn into an int. It says, wow, you're six. If you're confident with your reading already, you should totally learn Python, Hattie. Awesome. Now, if you read this script from the very top, it should be pretty clear to you what's going on. Well, I mean, especially since we wrote it together. But there's a little bit of logic here that is particular to a use case that I just introduced. It might be a little confusing as to why we are asking for age here. So there is a concept called comments. And what you can do is you can put in a sentence here. So let's do that. So to create a comment, you just put in a pound sign, also known as a hashtag, depending on your age. And then we just put our comment. So we can say this is just in case we have a younger user who can't yet read. And comments are great. And at this point in your learning journey, feel free to put them everywhere. A lot of students like to take notes for the different parts of their programs right in the comments, and that's totally fine. You'll see as this language becomes second nature that you'll probably need fewer comments. Now, comments are great for reasoning what might not be clear to readers of your code. However, if you're needing to explain what a line of code is doing, you might want to think about rewriting that line of code or breaking it down until it's more easy to understand. Writing readable code is a skill that improves over time and we'll build up your skill set together. One of the most wonderful things about Python in particular is how easily the language can be read. Now, part of this readability comes from the required indentation of the language. This code will not work if I remove some of the indentation. So I'm going to watch this. I'm going to go ahead and I'll take a little bit of this age off. And right away, see how it turned red? It's like, stop. So I'm going to go ahead and save this, even though that's red. And let's run it and see what happens. And you'll see that the error is actually on line 9 and not line 10. And it's saying that there is an indentation error. So what I want you to remember is to remember to look around when that happens. It's saying 10, but the error is actually on line 9. Let's clear this up. Whew, that feels better already. Speaking of reading code, what do you say we read through this one more time? So we came in here with Hattie, and first name now equals Hattie. And we say, hello, Hattie. And then we check to see if first name is equal to your name. It's Craig here in my code. And since it doesn't, we drop down to the next else if. And I say, is this equal to our student, Maximilian? Oh, it doesn't. So therefore, since none of these if statements turned out, we run into our final else. And that's here. And we ask input from our user of how old they are. And this comment directly above shows us why we might be doing that. The input function always returns a string. And we need to coerce that to an integer because we want to compare that in our next line here. We want to say, are you less than six? Less than or equal to six. Now, and because of my experience, seven is really about the time that you don't need to focus too much on reading. So much growth happens at five and six, but I don't think you're quite there yet reading level wise. So this definitely could read less than seven, which is essentially less than or equal to six, right? Now, if that expression was true, we print out this message. 
And when we call the format string, we're passing in an integer, but it's automatically coerced back into a string for us. And of course, that only happens if the age is less than six. And then everybody is suggested to learn Python. And then finally, have a great day. So how'd that feel? Did that all make sense? Now, if it didn't, let me remind you that you can rewind me. Just scrub your video player back a minute or so, and you can walk that code all again. Now, if it wasn't all crystal clear, remember, that is totally fine. This very well could be your first time looking at code. Think about how much of it you actually did understand, and then try to compare it to what you knew before we met each other way back when in that first video. It's kind of a lot of new stuff, isn't it? Great job immersing yourself. Stick with it. You got this. If you have questions, please ask them. Everyone is super nice in the community, and chances are someone else might be having the same question that you're having, and they just haven't asked it yet. Check the questions attached to this video. Can you help somebody? I want to reiterate that you're doing great learning the basics. Taking input and then branching to display different output based on various conditions is how most applications work. Think about how most websites that require you to sign in actually work behind the scenes. Now, if you aren't logged in, it shows you the buttons to log in or sign up. If you click the login button, the form shows up and you input your username and password. Now, in the case that you are logged in, it shows your profile picture, but you don't see the buttons. Think about what that code might look like. If the user is logged in, we display the user's avatar. Otherwise, we need to show the buttons. Now that display profile avatar is a function that we would need to write, and we'll get to that in a bit. But see the branching logic at play? See how the output is using a Boolean variable to determine which branch should work? Also, that login form, that's just taking input, right? Just like our command prompt. It returns what the website user entered so that the values can be used to log the user in. You just learned a bunch of concepts. You've got the building blocks that are present in all sorts of applications that you use today. I bet you'll start looking at your apps a little bit differently as you start to use them. I am excited for what's coming up next. We're gonna take a look at writing our own functions and how to use loops to repeat your code. I can't wait to get those functions and loops added to your ever-growing bag of tricks. Let's do this. We've used some predefined functions throughout this course, and they've proven to be super handy. You know, functions like print and input, and we also use lin. Functions are great. They provide a way for you to group multiple statements together to use later. They help you avoid duplicating your code. Now, if you ever find yourself writing the same exact code more than once, it's a symptom that something is likely wrong. Now, we refer to these symptoms as code smell, like, hmm, something about this code smells. Here, let me help you write some smelly code, and then we'll clean it up with the power of functions. Getting someone's attention these days is so hard. In application development, you like have to bounce an icon or make a noise to, to alert them, right? So one solution that we could do in our textual environment here is to yell in all uppercase. And I feel like the more exclamation points, the more likely they're going to see it. Let's do that. Let's create some text and then convert it to an uppercase and exclamatory phrase. So I'm going to make a new file, actually. So let's go here. We'll go to File and then New File. And I'm going to name it notifications.py. So the first thing that I would love to shout from the rooftops is some praise for you. So I'll assign it to the variable praise. And we'll say you are doing great. So we want to uppercase this, right? And what we'll do is we'll just reassign it. So we'll say praise is equal to praise.upper. And that's because strings are immutable and they can't be changed. So it returns a brand new string, which we're just going to take our label off the old one and put it on the new one. Now, I think there should be at least as many exclamation marks as there are characters in the string, you know, to really grab your attention. So to get the numbers of characters in the string, I can use the lin function. The lin function expects an object, so we'll pass in our variable. And then I'm going to store that in a new variable called number of characters. And I'm going to call the lin function. I'm going to pass in our string. There we go. 
So we want to create a new value that is a combination of this praise and the exclamation points. So let's create a new variable called result, and we'll make that praise, and we'll concatenate the exclamation point, and we're going to rely on order of operations here. So we'll say the exclamation point times the number of characters. And then finally, we'll print that out. We'll run Python notifications because it's a new file. There it is. You are doing great. And you are doing great. That is some good looking code and fine smelling too. You know what? I also like to remind you that you should remember to ask for help when you need it. So can we yell that too, please? So I don't see why not, right? So uh, let's make a new variable. We'll call that advice. And that is don't forget to ask for help. And then, hmm, well, I guess I would just copy this code, right? Just copy this code here and uh, paste it down here. I guess I would change, I need to change this praise and make that advice. And uh, I'd make this advice. I guess it's the length of advice, not the length of praise, because that's a different variable. And then we do this. So basically, I just copied and pasted that code and changed this variable name. That style of coding is called uh, copy pasta. And it's not a good habit to fall into. And it's really a bad habit, especially if you don't understand what the code you've copied <laughs> is doing. It happens all the time. So here we go. Let's keep going. You know what? I've got another piece of advice for you that I would love you to yell for me. In coding, there's an acronym that we call DRY or D-R-Y. Don't repeat yourself. Let's yell that. So I guess that's some more advice, right? So let's call that advice two. And we'll say don't repeat yourself. Keep things dry. Okay, so I guess I'll copy and pasta this. We'll put this here and I'll go ahead and do it, uh, advice two. Advice two, um, the length of advice two, and then we'll do uh, advice two. And then let's just make sure that this is working. Okay, it is. But what if I told you that we had like 10 more of these to do? Would you be excited about that? You know what? Actually, after seeing this in action, I'd like to make it so that there are half as many. This is, <laughs> this is ridiculous. That's way, way too many exclamation points. So I want to make only half of those as there are characters, right? So half of the amount of characters we should do. So one thing that I could think of doing is if we look, we can make it so that we use the, the floor division. That was that double division where we get an integer. So we can, if we divide the number of characters by two and keep it an integer, that should be that. And I'm going to put parens around here because I want the order of operations to work correctly. So uh, let's go ahead. Let's run that. Oh, that first one looks great, but the other two don't seem to be... Oh, rats. I forgot to update those two. Oh, because my code is duplicated, it means any change that I need to make, I have to change every single place I copied and pasta this code. And that's really smelly, right? So let's clean up this smell. Anybody got some Febreze? <laughs> totally missed product placement opportunity right there. <laughs> I guess functions are definitely an air freshener for these type of code smells. So let's create one, shall we? So the way that you create a function, let's get up here. The way that you create a function is with the keyword named def which is short for define. And then you give your function a name. Let's name it yell. That seems like exactly what we're doing, right? So we'll say yell. And then when you're defining a function, you define what parameters are expected when it's called. So in this case, we want to accept the text that should be yelled. Let's go ahead and we'll call that text. And then we add a colon because we're going to start the body of the function. And you press enter and see how it's indented automatically here. And now we are in what is called the function body. This is the code that is run when the yell function is called. 
So we basically want to do exactly what we did in our previous code that we were copying and pasting, right? So let's just do that one more time. We're going to copy this code here. I'm going to cut it out. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to paste it. And if you come in front of these lines and press tab, you can see that they tab into our body. So instead of praise, this is now text. I'm using shift and the arrow key to do that highlighting. You get better at those and you forget to say. So that's how I'm doing that. So text. That looks good. And it's really good style to leave at least one space after your function definition. So it's clear that it's a function where it ends. So now we can go ahead and call that. So let's do this. We'll get rid of this. We want to sign it anymore. We'll say, yell, you are doing great. And then we don't need this other code too. Let's, let's clean this up. So we'll say, yell, don't forget to ask for help. And then finally, let's go call this last one here. We'll say, yell, don't repeat yourself. Keep things dry. We'll get rid of these. That looks a lot better, right? Let's go ahead, let's run it, make sure that things are working. There we go, these lines are even shorter now. Great. So let's review what we've got. So we used the def keyword to define a new function named yell. Yell declares a parameter which is named text. This is the body of the function. It's all this code that's indented for spaces by our style definition. Now, the function body has code that uppercases and concatenates halfish the amount of text in the exclamation marks, and then it prints. We've got a blank line after our function definition because we're adhering to good coding style. It's important, right? I want you to keep in mind that just defining this function doesn't run the code. What it does is it creates a new name of yell that we can call later, and we can do it multiple times. So here, we're calling the yell method that we just created, and we're passing in a brand new string that we just created that says, you are doing great. So that's a brand new string. And then the values that you push into a function are called arguments. And since this is the first argument, right, there's only one, it's the first argument here. And it's called text here. So basically what this is saying is text equals you are doing great. That's what I want you to imagine. It says text equals you are doing great, and then the rest of the code runs on you are doing great. It runs through each one of these texts. You are doing great. You are doing great. Prints the result, and then it pops back out to whatever the next line is. In this case, it's another call to the yell function. And we create a new string that says don't forget to ask for help. And imagine again, text equals don't forget to ask for help, and then the rest of the function runs. It pops out. We get to the next one. Yell, don't repeat yourself, so on and so forth. I feel like I'm repeating myself. Now, also, if we wanted to change the way that this yell function worked, we only need to change it in one place. Like, for instance, I think even this two is a little long. Why don't we do it to a fourth of that? So if I come up in here, I can just change this in one place now, and all of those functions run. Functions are pretty handy, aren't they? We've just scratched the surface of how powerful these functions can be, but they definitely help you to create nice, reusable code. And try to stay on the lookout for lines of code that are repeated. Recognize the code smell. Don't repeat yourself is a great mantra to live by. It will lead you to write clean, understandable, and maintainable code. Everyone can agree that repeating what you're saying over and over is super annoying. Everyone can agree that repeating what you're saying over and over is super annoying. Everyone can agree that repeating what... Right? Keep things dry, everybody. You might have noticed that some functions actually return a value. When you call the function lin and pass it an object, it actually gives you a value back. In our case, it gave us the number of characters in our string. Another example is when I called the upper method on our string. It created us a new string and returned it. Remember, methods are really just owned functions. Our string owns that function upper. So another great feature of functions is you can take some arguments, process them, and then return a value to the caller of your function. So let's create a function that returns a value. Let's see. Ooh, I know. There are about a thousand apps that do something similar to this. You know how when you're out to dinner with a bunch of people and you need to split the checkup between each other? 
Let's write a function that takes the total of the bill and the number of people and then returns the value that each person owes. Okay, so let's create a new file and we'll call our app, call the script, let's call it check please. That's a good name. All right, and let's start defining our function. So let's see, names are hard. How about we define a new function called split check? All right. And we're gonna to need to define a couple of parameters, right? So let's see, we'll need the total of the bill. So we'll call that total. And we're also gonna to need to have the number of people involved in paying this bill, right? So to define multiple parameters for a function, you just separate them with a comma. And then you just keep declaring. So let's see, that's number of people. I think that's all we'll need, right? And then we don't want to forget the colon to signify that the body of our function is coming up. So how do we calculate this? Guess if we just divide the total by the number of people, we should be pretty good, right? So let's store that in a new variable. So we'll say cost per person uh, is equal to the total divided by the number of people. Seems to make sense. So this cost per person value is what we want to give back to whomever called this function. So we want to return this value. So not surprisingly, the keyword to return a value from within a function is return. So what you do is you say return and then the value. So we're gonna return cost per person. So now let's use our new function. So we know that the function is expected to return the cost per person, but in order to make sure that things are clear here, I'm gonna make a completely different named variable. Let's call it, um, let's call that amount due. I don't wanna confuse anybody. So again, you call a function, we're gonna assign amount due to the result of this function. So you call the function, so we'll say split check, and again, you call it with parens, and you put the arguments in here for the defined parameters. So for total, let's say that was $84.97. And then for the second parameter, that lines up, it was number of people. So we'll do four. There were four people, it cost $84.97. So now, the result from split check is stored in amount due just like we saw in our uh, notifications here when we did this call to Lynn text. So Lynn returned the number of characters and we stored it in a variable called number of characters. Same thing here. We are calling split check and we're storing it in amount due. And remember when we call this, this 8497 gets set. We can basically say total equals 8497 and then run this code. And then same thing here. Just imagine this being number of people equals four. And then when it's in here, it's four. And this total is, you know, 8497. And our function returned the value cost per person, which we stored in amount due. So since we now have a value, why don't we print it out? So we'll say print each person owes and then we'll go ahead and format that and we'll say amount due. So let's run it. Python, check please. It worked, but yikes, right? This is why you don't wanna use floats for currency. Now see these additional fractions of a cent over here? I'm pretty sure most people don't have uh, that extra 0 0.0025 cents on them. In fact, I'm pretty sure that most people don't even have the 24 cents on them. So what happens usually is whoever is paying the bill ends up paying the extra money for everybody. We should fix that in our version of this app. The fairest solution that I can think of is to round up to the next dollar. Now note, if we use the round function here, it would round down, right? Because 21.24 will go down to $21. But I'm suggesting that we should pay $22. As you can imagine, there's a way to do this mathematically. We could write it ourselves. But you know what? There's a function that exists for us already. The thing is though, 
we need to tell our script that we want to use it. It's not here by default. In order to bring in this grouping of new tools, we need to use a new keyword, a keyword's import. Here, let's take a look at it in the REPL real quick. Now, the name of the module, or grouping of tools, that I want to use is called math. We'll do a deeper look at modules and how to create them in a future course. But for now, we want to get our hands on some math functions. Okay, so we're going to import. The name of the module is math. And we can use functions in a module by writing the module name, so math. And then we use dot notation to get to the function, so dot. And the name of the function is seal, C-E-I-L, not the singer, which is short for sealing. Basically, what it does is always rounds up to the next closest integer. So let's do that. So we'll do 21.24 is what we had, right? So this should round up to 22, and it does. Now, of course, if you're interested, you can take a look at all other functions in the math module by doing help math. But again, don't feel like you need to understand all of these functions yet. I'm just showing you that you have a ton of functions here for you just waiting for you to call them. And this is just one module. Feel free to explore them. You aren't going to break anything. More in the teacher's notes. I'm going to drop out of the help. I'm going to drop out of the shell here too. And I'm going to clear. So let's use that math module and that ceiling function in our file. So style suggests that we should put all imports at the top of our file. So I'm going to do that and we'll say import math. And now that math is imported, we can just use it when we need it. And so what we want here is we want the ceiling of this value, right? So we can say math.seal. And there we go. So what happens is this will run and we'll get that, that 21.2455, whatever. And this will do the ceiling. It will round it up to the nearest integer. So let's go ahead. Let's rerun that. And boom, $22. Nobody's getting ripped off anymore. Amazing. So I suppose the next step to this is to allow for our script to take dynamic input from our users. So let's see. Let's just do that. We'll go here and we'll say um, the total due is equal to what is the total? Give them some space. Now, that's going to return a string, remember, but we want it to be a float. So let's coerce that. So we'll just wrap this. We'll say float. Awesome. And next, we need the number of people. So let's coerce that to an int. So we'll say number of people equals an int of input. How many people? See how the braces line up there? Awesome. And now that we have those values, we'll use them in our function call here. So we'll say, let's just move this. We'll get rid of this here, move this down here. Say the amount due is, so the total due, we'll pass that in there and we'll pass in the number of people. There we go. Let's run that real quick. Let's make sure that works. What's the total? We got 100. Oh, they're divided by three people, $34. Awesome. One more little bit of cleanup here. I want to point out something that I did intentionally. Now, see how in the function body here, we are creating a variable called cost per person, and we never actually use it. We just return it. Well, we can, and we should skip that unnecessary variable assignment. It's a little strange to see it first, which is why I used the variable assignment originally. So, we know that math.seal is a function that returns an integer, right? So I'm going to take this, I'm going to cut this, and we'll paste this right here. What we can do is we can just return the result. So you can read this like math.seal returns an integer value. And then we return that value to the caller of split check. I hope that makes sense. There's no need to create that variable just to turn around and return it. So now we've got a super functional function, right? What could go wrong? Well, as soon as you bring users into the equation, you'll start to see errors that you didn't anticipate. Like, let's go ahead and run this again. Let's say 
let's say that the bill total was 20 and then something like this, four of us. How many people? There were four of us. Yuck. We should probably handle that better. That error is pretty intense for a user, isn't it? Now, watch this classic one. We're going to call the check, please. And it was $40. And I'm going to put in a zero saying zero people are paying. Zero division error. Oh, no. If you don't remember from your math class, you can't divide by zero. It, like, opens a wormhole in outer space or something intense like that. We don't want our users doing that. We don't want them seeing this. So let's take a quick break and then swing back into our script and protect our users from themselves. Murphy's Law states, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Now, that's a pretty negative way of looking at the world. But it's a pretty good way to think about how users might use your application. If they can break it, they will. We've seen some syntax errors getting thrown when we write improper code. But as we just witnessed, our users can also create errors as our program is running. When they don't do what we expected them to do, these types of errors are called exceptions. The experience for a user when we run into one of these exceptions can be pretty intense. There was a stack trace and some of our code even and a message and our program didn't even finish. It just stopped right there on the line that caused the error. We shouldn't show that to the user. I'm sure you've seen an application where the error wasn't handled properly. The good news is that there is a way to handle these exceptions gracefully. Let's see if we can't clean up those exceptions that we just saw. So let's make our user-facing exception happen again. Let's kick off the program. So we'll say, Python, check please. And what was the total value? It was too much. Now, obviously, we can't coerce that saying into a float. So let's look what the error is, though. So we, we definitely don't want the user to see this, right? Can you imagine seeing this? What is a traceback? I just want to split my check. So let's fix it. If you have some code that you think might cause for some exceptional activity, like any of this type coercion stuff, any of that, it's great for this sort of thing. You can put it in what is known as a try. So try is a statement. So let's do that. We'll say try. And of course, that's followed by a block. So we need a colon. And what you do is you put your possibly problematic code in that try block. So here, let's move these in. I'm just going to tab this in, tab this in. And now what we want to do is write the code that handles that this exception has happened. So the keyword that we want to use is accept. So we say accept. Now, as you know, there are different types of errors. So you want to catch just this one error that we're doing now. And as we saw, it's a value error. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to right click, copy, and I'm going to paste it here. And then I'm going to put a colon. And now the body of this is what will run should an exception happen, should this specific exception happen. So what do we want to say? Well, let's, let's keep it user friendly. We'll say print. How about, oh no, that's... Not a valid value. Try again. Feel like I've seen that before, right? All right. Now let's see what we got. Python check, please. What's the total? Too much. Well, there's our message. Oh, no, that's not a valid value. Please try again. But then we got a trace back again. Hmm. Oh, but look, this is different. This is a name error. And this says name total do is not defined. That's weird. It's right here. Now, in order to understand this, we need to figure out what's happening inside this try block. So we came into the try block. And what happened was we asked for this input and we returned a string. And then the float tried to coerce that. And that raised an exception. It raised a value error exception. And so what happened was this line, this whole line never ran. This float line ran, but it didn't return because it hit the exception. So it popped into here and it wrote this. So what happened was this assignment never actually occurred. It never happened. So when we get down here, we're talking about total due and it was never assigned. Aha, name error. What you talking about? So what we really want is we only want this code to run, this amount due, we, and actually the print statement for that matter. We only want that to run if 
and only if there was no exceptions. So the try block also allows for what's known as an else, just like we saw in an if statement. So let's do that. So we'll say else, and then that's a block, and we can bring these up. So this can be read like try this code, except if there is a value error, in which case run this code. Otherwise, if everything's great, run this code. Now, you might be thinking that I definitely could have put this code just up here in the try statement. I didn't actually need this else. But what I'm communicating to readers of this particular code is that this code here is expecting an error. If I put this up here, I'm not really worried about those throwing a value error at the moment. So this is specifically saying these might throw a value error. So what do you say? Let's try it again. Let's see how we did. Check, please. Too much. There we go. Oh, no, that's not a valid value. Try again. Got it. All right. So we now have our coercion error handling working pretty smooth. Let's see what happens now with our zero error. So again, we want Python check, please. What's the total? It was 20 bucks, and there were zero people. Okay. So now we still have that zero division error. So we could actually handle multiple exception types. So one thing that you could do is you could just say, accept the zero division error. And then I'd write the code here, uh, write, write some code here to do write exception handling code. But wait a second, I'm going to undo that. So let's undo this. Command Z again, undo. I want to note that the exception is coming from within our split check method. I could wrap this math seal code in a try and an accept block. But actually, if you think about it, zero is an invalid value for this function. You can't split a check with zero people. Actually, you know what else? Hold on a second. What happens if we say Python check, please? 20 bucks, and we're going to split that with negative 12 people. Each person owes negative $1. So does that mean the restaurant owes us a dollar? You can't split a check with negative 12 people. You can't even have negative 12 people. So we really should consider less than or equal to zero as an exception. And we should raise that exception so that others could catch it. Just like this call to float did, right? Float said, hey, I can't do that. I'm going to raise an exception. And then you handle it. You know what we should do? We should do that too. We should make our split check raise an exception. It seems like good software design, right? Let's take a look at how to raise exceptions right after this quick break. Our split check function here is currently allowing callers of our function to pass in arguments that are invalid. Now, as it is, if number of people comes in as zero, we end up opening up that wormhole with a zero division error. Also, we end up allowing for a negative amount of people to split a check, which makes it look like the restaurant actually owes us some money. So let's do this. Let's verify that we have a good value. And if we don't, let's let the caller know that they've caused an exception. So we need to make sure that our value is greater than zero. Well, actually, wait a second. Why would you split a check with one person? That should probably not be allowed either. Our math would work, but that's not the point. So uh, let's see. So right in here, right at the top, let's check. Let's see. If the number of people is less than or equal to one. So in order to cause an exception to happen, you use the keyword raise. And then you use the name of the exception that you want to raise. And so we want to raise a value error, right? Because this is a bad thing. So here, here we got value error. I'm going to copy and paste that. So we have value error. So raise value error. And then you can add additional arguments here, and they will be part of the exception when it's displayed. Watch. So we say more than one person is required to split the check. Great. There we go. So the way that raise works is as soon as this line is ran, the function exits, and the exception is bubbled up to the caller, meaning it comes out of this and the caller has it. So if the error is handled there, then the exception handling code will run. And if not, the program ends and you see the traceback. So let's review how this function is actually being called. So we're trying to coerce values. 
and we're catching a value error if that were to happen. And if it doesn't, this else block happens. Okay, right. And this is where we call the split check function. So right now, this line is actually not in the try block. So our error is currently unhandled. So let's go ahead and run it and see what it looks like when the error is unhandled. So Python check, please. I want 20. And how many people? There are zero. Yikes. But look, here's our value error. And more than one person is required to split the check. So since we're raising a value error, our try block is already handling. So what we could do is we could just move this line up into here. And there we go. And now it will get caught. So let's do that. Let's try that one more time. I'm going to clear this. Python check, please. 20 bucks, zero people. Oh, no, that's not a valid value. Try again. We lost our messaging, though. Hmm. That's a bummer. Now, one thing you can do is to get a reference to the exception that was raised. And you can do this with a new keyword that's called as. So you say accept value error as error. We'll just call it ERR. That's a new variable that will be created and it will be assigned the exception that was thrown. So now we can just print that out. Like, uh, for instance, one thing that we could do is just to write it out in a new message to the console. So let's do that. Let's surround our error with some placeholders there. So we'll say dot format and we'll push in the error. There we go. And if we run this again, let's 20, zero. There's our message inside the parentheses. More than one person is required to split the check. That's pretty clean, right? There we go. Awesome. We've now communicated very clearly to users of your function that they need at least two people to split a check. And even if they try something funny, like giving a negative amount of people, our calculation code won't even run. We'll raise an exception before it gets there. When I say users of your function, I want to remind you that you are going to write code that other people are going to want to use. Being thoughtful and explicit about your exceptions that you raise can really help your fellow coders. If you or someone else ever wants to call that function that you just created, now that logic that protects it so you can only split a check with two or more people is actually encoded inside the function. Other callers of that function won't have to write or even think about that exceptional logic themselves. In programming, a while loop is code that continuously repeats until a certain condition is no longer met. If I think about my day to day, I've already used a few of these loops. In the shower this morning, while there was soap on my body, I rinsed. Afterwards, while I was wet, I dried my body. There's two loops and I was just waking up. Then, while my coffee cup was empty, I filled it. Once my cup was full, I stopped pouring. While there was cereal left in my bowl, I took some bites. Loops occur all the time in applications that we build. While data is loading, show that waiting spinner. While the deal that will expire eventually hasn't yet, update the countdown clock. While the user hasn't entered the correct password, prompt for a retry. Ooh, that's a great idea. Let's write a simple little password checker loop. So this is not going to be very robust, and you should never actually use this code in a final application. But it's a pretty good example of how while loops work. So I'm just giving you this warning now. This is like one of those do not try this at home warnings, okay? All right, so let's do this. Let's create a new file. We'll say file, new file, and we will call this password checker.py. So what we'll do right from uh, the start is we'll prompt for a password. We'll say password equals input, please enter a super secret password. I guess it's not A, it's the. Please enter the super secret password. I gave some space there. Now, already, that's a bad idea. So here this password is going to be right on the screen, right as you type it out. Someone could look over their shoulder and capture it. Do not try this at home. Okay, so if the user doesn't get the password right, we should let them try again. Password typos are super common. 
So what we'll do is we'll use a new keyword that kicks off our loop, and that word is while. And that's followed by an expression that will be checked each iteration through the loop. This is very much like an if statement. So if the expression is true, continue the loop. So that expression is uh, if password is not equal to uh, whatever the password is. So we'll say open sesame. That's my password, by the way. So we've got a colon. So we're into a block of code that will repeat. And that's what we'll do is we'll just ask again. We'll say password equals input invalid password. Try again. And what happens is after the last line of the while block is finished, there's only one right now. So after this line is finished, execution returns to the while expression again. And if this is true, it will run the block again. So let's go ahead and write a message so that we can see if we were successful. Let's see, let him into this little uh, secret world we have over here. So welcome to Secret Town. Okay, let's give this a run. So we'll say Python password checker. Enter the super secret password. So I'm going to enter in food. Ah, invalid password. Please try again. So because password, which uh, was food, did not equal open sesame, this line of code ran. And uh, so we're here now. Invalid password, please try again. Let's print it out to the screen. Let's do one more, the password in my luggage. And you'll see that again, one, two, three, four, five is not equal to open sesame. And it will continue until this condition is false. So let's make that false. Open sesame is actually equal to open sesame. Welcome to Secret Town. Again, this is totally not secure at all. Anyone could actually just read this file here and see our password in plain text right there. Not a good idea. Another thing to take note of is this. We'll never see that retry message if this is ever false. The loop would never run because the condition is false from the get-go. You know what? Let's add an additional check. We don't want hackers to keep on trying and using brute force to figure out our password. Let's only allow them three attempts before we, we break out of it. So we'll keep track of our attempt account. So this first one here, we'll say attempt count equals one. And then we'll increment by one after each password attempt. So we'll say here, we'll say attempt count and much like the in-place addition that we did on strings, you can do that on numbers too. So attempt count equals plus equals one. So that's attempt count equals attempt count plus one, more or less, right? Just some nice shorthand. So at the start of this loop, we can check and see if the count is more than three, right? So we can say if attempt count is greater than three, what should we do? So you can actually stop a program running. But first, we need to import a module, and that module name is sys, which is not for sister, it's short for system. Import sys. And the name of the function that we're going to call is exit. So we'll do sys.exit. Now, the way that sysexit works, if you pass any value to sys.exit, it's considered an error. So whoever ran the program will get back the fact that an error happened in their code which is kind of what we want to have happen here. So let's, let's give it a message here. We'll say too many invalid password attempts. So let's clear this, see what happens. So we will run Python password checker. Okay, so let's try spam. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try lumberjack. No, cheese shop. How about hovercraft? So there's, this should be our last attempt, right? Too many invalid password attempts. And see, it printed it out there too. Really nice. Were those password choices confusing? One thing that I always like to make sure that people know when they're just getting started learning Python is that the language is not based on the snake. It is quite possibly, surprisingly, named after the British comedy group Monty Python.
Now, I like to mention this because you're going to see Python code in documentation and blog posts that use some very strange examples. You'll see lots of spam and eggs and lumberjacks and hovercrafts full of eels, which is super weird, especially if you don't know that all of these are based on Monty Python skits. So actually, I do recommend watching some Monty Python. Now, not only because they are some of the most amazing, absurdist comedy sketches ever created, but also because it will help with some of the more inside jokes. It'll help them make sense. I always feel for those of you who might be perplexed by the references, but also, I cannot even imagine what that must be like for learners who have English as a second or third language. A parrot is a speaking bird, no? Why is the code talking about a parrot being electrocuted? Is it because it speaks? No, I'm sorry. It's because of a joke that was made in the late 1970s. How'd you miss that one? Check the teacher's notes for more. You know, one more thing that I'd like to tackle stylistically here is that I don't like how our password is in the middle of this code. It's kind of down here in this code, right? It's a value that we might want to change, but it will remain constant during the running of this program. So one thing that we can do is to create a variable near the top of the file, and I'm going to call it underneath our import here, I'm going to call it master password. Now note that I used all capital letters. This is a naming convention for constants. So we'll say master password, and I'm gonna get rid of this here. Put that here. And then I'm gonna use master password here. This master password is not something that I ever plan on changing while the program is running. It's a constant value. And I'm conveying that to readers of this code by using all capital letters and placing it at the top of the file. So it's the first thing that they see. And then I'm gonna use that in our while loop. Now, if we ever wanted to change the password, you just need to tweak the constant variable. Check the teacher's notes for more on constants. While loops are great for when you want code to run until a condition is no longer true. Now, in this case, you aren't sure when the loop will end. There's another type of loop that is great for when you have a certain amount of items to loop through. It's called for. And I'll show you what it's good for right after this break. The while loop is wonderful for condition-based looping. Well, this condition is true, run this code. There's another type of looping that I'd like to show off here, and it's for when you want to iterate through a set of values. For instance, think back to our banner example that we used to talk about strings. Now we can actually loop over each letter in this banner. Now we can say for each letter in this banner, run some code. Hey, let's do that in the shell here. I'll set up the banner object. Banner equals happy birthday. So the keyword is for, and we're gonna say letter in banner. That reads very nice, doesn't it? So for each letter in the banner, I'm gonna press enter, and you'll notice that there's three dots now instead of the chevrons, instead of the three greater than signs, there's three dots. And that's because it's waiting for us to finish this block of code. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, and we'll print letter dot upper. So what's happening is each time through, it's setting that letter variable. And now it's, I still have dots because it's waiting for me to finish. So here we go. Happy birthday, all capitals. What happens here is that each time through the loop, each one of these loops, this letter variable is set. And you can use it in the body of the function. The loop runs through each item on this side of the in keyword and creates a new variable here on the left side, that value. The right side of this in keyword has one requirement. It must be iterable. Now I find it helpful to break that word iterable down to must be able to be iterated because what we're doing here is looping through or accessing each element. We're iterating through the values. Now, strings have been designed to be iterable. Each step through the loop provides the next letter in the iteration. There are also many other types in Python that are iterable, and Python allows you to create your own types that you can also iterate on. We'll get to more iterable types here in future courses. Check the teacher's notes for more. Now, do you see the difference between the while and for loops? For just runs from the start to the finish of an iterable. It runs through each and every value it's given from the iterable. 
With the addition of functions and loops to your toolset, you are now ready to write some pretty powerful applications. You might not believe me yet, but the skills that you've picked up thus far, input and output, conditional branching, math, exception handling, looping, and functions, are the foundations for almost all of the rest of the work that you'll do in programming. There's always gonna be more to learn, but you're now armed with quite an arsenal of solutions for just about any problem that you might encounter. I get it though. It's hard to see how to combine all the different skills that you've just picked up. Let's do this. Let's wrap this course up with a little simulation that will produce some working software that utilizes most of your newfound Python superpowers. Okay, so let's set up our simulation for the final project of this course. I'm gonna stitch together a bunch of your skills and we'll build a pretty solid application. Let's pretend that all of the remaining cast members of the comedy group Monty Python are going to get together and do a question and answer session. They're gonna be discussing what it's like for them as a comedy group to have jokes that they made over three decades ago still referenced in Python tutorials and code examples. It would be such an amazing discussion because surely they didn't see that coming. They have a very strong fan base alive and well in this programming language subgroup. Now, let's also imagine, since they're funny like this, that they want to have the only way that you can buy tickets is through a single Python script. No website, no app, just a single console app. You can only buy tickets using a command line program where no one would expect it. Spain, in a cheese shop. You've been tasked with writing that program. Sound fun? There's some very specific instructions and I've gone and captured them for us in a tool. Let's walk through the product requirements. So this is Trello. It's a free tool and it works really great for keeping track of tasks. There are many different ways to build an application and I figured that we take a quick look at one of my personal favorites, Scrum. Now, if you'd like to learn more about Scrum, check the teacher's notes. Scrum encourages you to break down requirements from your client into what are known as user stories. And they are a great way to make sure that developers and the client understand what they are building together and for what purpose. Now, I've gone through already and written them out for this project. And they're in the format like I have here. So as a role or user case, I should be able to, and then basically whatever the request is, so that business reason. Uh, I'm going to use Trello as a task board. Now, some teams actually use sticky notes in their office and they move stories from to do, in progress, and then to done. Anyone in the office can walk up to the board and move it over so people don't end up working on the same code. Trello just does this online for us. We'll introduce ways for you to work and share code with your teammates as you continue through these courses. Check the teacher's notes for more. But for now, we're just gonna use this like a task list. The different columns here are different states that a ticket could be in. Backlog is just all of the requests that ever came in for this project. So we'll move stuff that we agree that we can do to the to-do column, and then we'll work through those. We'll leave ones that we're not ready for yet in the backlog. Now, I find that this really helps me keep focused on the task at hand, and I can get a bird's eye view of all that is left. Does it sound good? Why don't we take a read through these tickets that I built? Okay, so this first one here. As a user, I should be shown the number of tickets left remaining so I can understand the importance of buying now. That makes sense. Got to give them a little bit of FOMO. As a user, I should have a personalized experience so that I feel welcomed by the brand. Cool. We'll have to get to know what their name is, I guess, right? As a user, I should have errors reported in a user-friendly manner. That is totally true of just about every application. I'm glad this is a ticket. We can work through that one. As a user, I should be able to request a certain amount of tickets, like how many you want to buy, and be told the total cost so that I can determine if I want to purchase the tickets. Okay, that makes sense. We can do that. As a user, I should be able to confirm my order so that I do not accidentally purchase more tickets than intended. You'd hate to have somebody accidentally buy a thousand tickets, right? And then finally, as a user, I should not be offered tickets if there are any available. That would be horrible. You don't want to sell something when you're out of it, right? So there are limited amounts of seats to this performance that we're having. And as a user, I should be able to purchase using credit cards and Bitcoin. Wow, that is out of our scope right now. We're not going to get to that one. But I do feel pretty good about these to-do tickets. I think we can knock all of these out. Does sound like fun? You can totally build this. Let's get started right after this quick break. 
Okay, so there is a new workspace attached to this video and I'd like for you to launch it. It has a single file in it called masterticket.py. That's not trademarked, is it, master ticket? This file has a single constant defined, ticket price. $10, that's very reasonable. There's also a counter that is called tickets remaining and it's been set up to have 100 tickets available. Wow, that's a pretty small and intimate space. Let's say we grab the first user story here of as a user, I should be shown the number of tickets left remaining so I can understand the importance of buying now. I'm gonna put that in progress. So let's flip back over here. I'm gonna make a comment for us. So we wanna output how many tickets are remaining using the tickets remaining. All right, we can do that. Here, I'll tell you what. I'll pause, and why don't you write this output statement? And after you get it, unpause me, and I'll show you my implementation. Are you ready? Pause me. Here's how I did it. So I'm gonna print, there are, and I'm gonna use string formatting, tickets remaining. And I'm gonna format, I'm gonna pass in the tickets remaining variable. Awesome. Well, let's flip to Trello. We've already got one done. This feels pretty amazing, doesn't it? Okay, so next up, let's grab this personalized experience one. I should have a personalized experience so that I'm welcomed by the brand. So I'm gonna move that to in progress. And okay, so to personalize things, we need to capture our user's name. We're gonna need to use it a bit to make things seem personalized, right? So here, let me make this comment here for us. Why is that indenting? We're gonna say gather. Oh, you know why it's indenting? Look at this. Look what I forgot. You see how that's indenting there? What's well, missing? I forgot this. There we go. Whew. All right, so I'm going to make a comment. So we'll say gather the user's name and assign it to a new variable. Okay, you totally got this. Go ahead and pause me, and after you get it, unpause me and I'll show you how I did it. Ready? So here's what I did. I came in here and I said name equals input. What is your name? And I left some spaces because we know how that feels. So we can't really personalize anything because there's nothing here yet. So let's flip back over to the tasks. Oh, here's a good one. As a user, I should be able to request a certain amount of tickets and be told the total cost so that I can determine if I want to purchase the tickets. We can totally use this personalization in the prompt. That sounds good. Let's do that. Okay, so let's see. We got like three steps here, right? So we've got prompt the user by name and ask how many tickets they would like. Sounds good. So personalizing it, we'll say, hey, Bob, how many tickets would you like? And then we'll, we need to do some calculation. So we'll calculate the price. What is that? That would be the number of tickets that they want, right? Um, multiplied by uh, the price. And you could use, you should use that ticket price variable up there. And then we will assign that to a variable. And then finally, uh, I think we just need enough to output the price to the screen for this story to be done. So we'll say uh, output the price to the screen. Okay. So there's three tasks there. I want you to take them nice and slow. You can totally do this. If you get stuck along the way, I invite you to hit up your teammates who are also working through this in the community. And you can also unpause me and I'll give you a warning before I start the other ones. Ready? You got this. Pause me. Okay, so the first thing that I did was I got num tickets and input how many tickets would you like? And then I'm going to put the placeholder of their name in here and then a couple spaces. And let's go ahead and do format, and then we'll push the name in, okay? Close that print off, awesome. 
Now, to calculate the price, and this might have been tricky, this might have caught some of you, we first need to make sure that we have an integer. So what I did was I reassigned num tickets. So I said num tickets equals the int of num tickets. So now we have an integer in num tickets. It was reassigned. Okay, and then I calculated the price. And that was uh, amount due. And that's equal to the num tickets times the ticket price. Okay, how'd you do? Hope that coercion didn't trip you up. Okay, and finally, I output the total again using the format method on strings. And it doesn't matter that amount due is an integer. It automatically coerces it to a string for us. So, so print total due is... So this is what mine looks like when it runs. Does yours work? Let's see, we'll say Python master ticket. My name is Craig and I would like to buy three tickets. Total due is 30 bucks. Awesome. Is yours working too? So let's flip over to Trello and we've got both of these done. That's a personalized experience. We got to remember to keep doing that. They seemed really keen on that. And they're also able to request a certain amount of tickets and we got told the total cost. We are cruising along. Let's tackle the next few user stories right after this quick break. Okay, so looking at these, why don't we go ahead and grab this one first? So as a user, I should be able to confirm my order so that I do not accidentally purchase more tickets than intended. And I wanna do that one because I know that that's right after what we just did. We just showed them the price. So let's prompt and see if they wanna buy them. Let's do it. So I'm gonna put that in, in, in progress. Let's flip over here. So we just showed the total due. So let's come in here and let's ask if they want to continue, right? So uh, we'll say prompt user if they want to proceed. And typically the way that you do that in these console applications is you ask them for a Y or an N for a yes or no. Uh, so we can do that. And then if they answer that they do want to proceed, so if they want to proceed, we got a couple of things, right? So we need to branch out on that decision. So let's, how are we going to mark this? Let's do it this way. I'll do this on separate lines. So if they want to proceed, we're going to uh, print out to the screen. Let's just print out sold so that we can confirm the purchase. Because remember, we're not going to process the credit card. So we'll say to confirm purchase. And because they did purchase it, we need to decrement or reduce by the number of tickets that they actually bought, right? So uh, let's see. And then decrement or reduce by the tickets remaining by the number of tickets purchased. Cool, so that's if it did work. So let's do that, we'll give you a separate line there. And then uh, of course we have our otherwise. So they wanna keep it friendly, right? So let's just go ahead and uh, otherwise let's thank them by name. That sounds good. All right, so it sounds like some branching logic based on their decision of Y or N. You got it? Now go ahead and take these line by line. You got this. Check the teacher's notes and use the forum if you get stuck. Ready? Pause me. Okay, all set? So here's what I did. I prompted again and I was using input and I stored that in a variable called should proceed. Pretty clear, right? Uh, input, do you want to proceed? And I gave them a Y slash N. I just wrote it there. Give a couple spaces. And so that will come up and they'll say yes or no. And so uh, if they want to proceed, so if should proceed. Now, something I did here uh, is I made, I'm checking the lowercase version of should proceed just in case they entered a lowercase Y or a capital Y, either one. If either one of those is Y, right? Lower. So if Y is equal to Y, we're gonna open up that body and we're gonna print out to the screen, sold. 
And it looks like we are indented too far here, aren't we? Let's go ahead and bring this back. Starting to feel a little awkward there. There we go. So we're gonna print sold. And then we're gonna decrement the tickets remaining. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna add a reminder here for us. I'm gonna put in a to-do. Uh, Spanish speakers sometimes think that that means all. I've, I've, I've worked with a few native Spanish speakers and to-do, they think it's like todo, like all. It means to-do, like we're gonna do this later. So we're gonna gather credit card information and process it. Awesome. And that's already on the Trello board. We won't commit to completing it just yet, but I'm gonna leave this here so next time we come into the code, we know it's there. And now I'm gonna use in place subtraction on tickets remaining. Just like we've done in place addition, you can also do it with subtraction. So tickets remaining minus equals num tickets. Right, so that's shorthand for tickets remaining equals tickets remaining minus num tickets. Just using that minus equal for in place subtraction. And so this otherwise, this is an else clause here, right? So else, we're gonna print. Otherwise, we're gonna thank them by name and we'll print, well, thank you anyways, placeholder. And we'll format that, pass in that name, close that up. Okay, I'm gonna save this and give it a run. Let's see what mine looks like right now. How do you do? There are a hundred tickets remaining. What is your name? My name's Craig. I would like to have three tickets. The total due is 30. Do you want to proceed? No way. So it's not why, right? And it says, thank you anyways. So let's do the other one. My name's Craig. Craig, sure. And I want to buy four tickets. Uh, and do you want to proceed? Yes. As a matter of fact, I do, but I lowercase y want to proceed. Sold. So I don't actually know if that decrementing the tickets remaining actually worked, but I think maybe another ticket will get us there. So let's flip back to the Trello board real quick. Let's look over there. I think we're done with this confirmation one. Nice job. Okay, so as a user, I should not be offered tickets if there aren't any available. Let's move that into in progress. Awesome, and let's flip back. So I think we can tackle this one, but we're going to need to assume that there's some sort of continuum, right? This code will continue to run until there aren't any tickets left. So let's see, we want all of this code, right? We want all of this code that we wrote, like from here on down, we want that to go, right? That makes sense. So we want to run this code continuously until we run out of tickets. Makes sense, so it just keeps on prompting, keeps on saying that stuff. And then at the very end, we need to let them know when they sell out. So let's just scroll all the way down here. Look at this, we're at 38 lines right now. So we are going to, um, here, we're gonna notify the user that the tickets are sold out. Of course, after they are sold out, after the continuum has happened. So. One thing before I let you go, I wanna show you this because uh, it seems fair. If you highlight this, you can go ahead and you can uh, do an edit and you can indent. And you'll see here on my Mac, it's command and then right bracket. So if you highlight some code, you can do command right bracket or left bracket to go in and out to indent. That helps when you wanna move a block over. So you got this, right? You wanna run this code while there are still some tickets left. And then at the very bottom, you want to print sold out when there aren't tickets available anymore. You got this. Ready? Pause me. Okay, so here's how I did it. So while there are tickets remaining, and then I went all the way down to the bottom, I held down shift and went all the way down to the bottom here. And then I went ahead and indented that. And down here, we're just gonna say print. Sorry, the tickets are all sold out. I'm gonna make an emoji sad face. So that seems appropriate. Now, note, I use the truthiness of tickets remaining. When this gets down to zero, it will be false. Remember, any number other than zero is true. You know what though? 
since I just had to explain that to you, maybe I should be more explicit. So let's do that. Well, tickets remaining are greater than or equal to one. We will run this code and then we will notify them when they're sold out. Okay, well, let's see how we did. We'll say Python master ticket. What is your name? My name is John and I would like to have 98 tickets, please. Total due is 980, that seems reasonable, let's do it. Oh, there's two tickets left. So now Terry comes in, he buys two. Total due is 20, Terry wants it. Sold, and now the tickets are all sold out, boom. Nice job. No more offering of tickets. All right, so let's move this over, this is donezo. Feels so good, doesn't it, making something done? So, how'd you do? If you had any problems, remember to ask in the community if Anything at all isn't clear. We'll get it sorted out. Okay, and we'll tackle those user-friendly errors next. It's our last ticket. I'm gonna move it to in progress. I'm gonna clean up these comments. They're getting a little busy, these instructional ones. So uh, we'll get rid of this. So I'm using, again, Command-Shift-D to delete some lines here. Let's bring these up. Don't need that anymore. Don't need that, or that, or those. Get rid of that. I'm gonna leave that to do because we definitely need to do that later. Get rid of this, get rid of the otherwise, and the thanks. Sold tickets, get rid of this line. There we go, it's actually 20 lines of code. Awesome, Whew, that feels better. I'm gonna save it. And now that we've got this cleaned up, should we walk this real quick with those missing? Remember that we are on the, as a user, I should have errors reported in a user-friendly manner, which is kind of always the case, but we really wanted to make sure that we handled this because they saw one of the trace banks that I left earlier, so. All right, here we go. First off, so here we have a constant and it's an all uppercase. It won't change while the program's running. And if the group wants to change this in the future, it's a very easy place to change it, constants. So these, are how many tickets are currently available. Now note, it's not all uppercase. So we can assume that this is going to change. Then we have, while there is one or more tickets remaining. Okay, we're gonna keep on looping through all this code. And we're gonna show how many are left. Then we're gonna grab their info. What's your name? How many tickets? We're gonna coerce that because input always returns a string, but we need to use num tickets for a math purpose. So we definitely need an integer. Now it's an integer because you can't buy fractions of a ticket. I'd like to buy one and a half tickets, please. That doesn't work. So if you remember, this seems a little bit dangerous, doesn't it? What if the user gave us something that we couldn't coerce? Let's keep this in mind for a possible problem. Okay, and then we calculate the price and then we show them the total. And we ask them, yes or no, do you want to proceed? And because we aren't sure if they're going to use an uppercase Y or a lowercase in responding, we lowercase it and we check. We uh, left a nice to-do message here that the sold is not uh, really actually taking any credit cards. And then we subtract the number of tickets from the tickets remaining. What would happen if the user entered a thousand tickets? Whoa that'd be negative 900 tickets remaining. The, the while loop up here, this would stop, right? Because it'd be negative 900. That would stop. It's not greater than or equal to one, but still the thousand ticket sale would go through. We got to catch that, right? So, and then finally, anything other than why, uh, they're going to say thank you anyways, and we're going to be friendly about it. And then we're going to let people know that those tickets are sold out because the loop's over. So once that loop's over, they know. Did that feel pretty good being able to read most of that? That's pretty cool, right? You're pretty amazing. All right, now let's take care of these errors. Let's do one at a time. So the first problem that we have is here, one around coercion, right? So remember, the user can add anything here. So let's run it to see how bad the errors actually are. So I'm gonna clear this. Let's run Python master ticket. And our name is Galahad. How many tickets would you like? Blue. Ah! What a gross error. And our program ended. We can't have that happening. We won't be able to sell anything more if we drop out like that. So it throws a value error. 
I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to copy that. And right above here, right above this int num tickets, let's say uh, expect a, a paste of value error to happen and handle it appropriately. I'm going to give you a hint. Remember to test it out. Pause me and give it a go. Are you ready? All right. Ready? This is how I went about fixing it. So I definitely needed a try block. So we'll do the block here. And we want to be careful about that num tickets. And I want to accept, we know that that throws a value error. And what we want to say is print, oh no, we ran into an issue. Please try again. Now that feels good, doesn't it? But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run this. And my name is Galahad. And I would like, how many ticks would you like? Blue. Total do was blue, 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 blue. What? How is the blue, 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 blue? Oh, yes. Remember, this is where the error happened and the assignment never happened. So num tickets here is the string blue. And because you can multiply strings, right, repeat the same thing a number of times, this repeated however much the ticket price was, which is 10. So those are 10 blues right there. Aye. So in order to fix that, I need to put this code in an else. Because we only want this code to run if we know how many there are. So let's do this. And I'm going to indent it with command right bracket. And let's go ahead and if you want to ever stop out of a program while it's waiting at a prompt, you can do a control C and it will send this interrupt. So let's run that one more time. Make sure it's working. My name is Galahad Blue. And it says, oh no, we ran into an issue. And then it just keeps on looping. There's 100 tickets remaining. Awesome. Okay, now we have another error too, don't we? We don't want to allow for that thousand ticket sale, right? We need to block that. So... Why don't we do that in the try portion here? So if we come up here into our try, we want to make sure that we have a valid number of tickets to request, right? So we will raise a value error if the request is for more tickets than are available. And then I want to make sure that that's a user-friendly error that we raise. So what I want to do next is I want to include in the output here, we want to include the error text in the output. All right. Remember, you can lean on the community. And also, you can rewatch the previous video where we did something similar. Check the teacher's notes. You got this. Are you ready? Pause me. Ready? So here's what I did. So I used an if statement up here. So I said if... The number of tickets, that's what they asked for, is greater than the tickets remaining. You can't do that. You can't buy those tickets. So what we did was we raised a value error. And I'm going to go ahead and be very specific. There are only, I'll use a placeholder here, tickets remaining. Nice try. So then we'll do format. We'll say tickets remaining and then we'll do a closing brace here okay and then if i want to use that exception you have to use the as keyword did you remember that if not don't fret we only did that one time in this course the more you practice the more you'll be able to recall it so you have to use the as keyword so as err -R. so oh no we ran into an issue i'm going to go ahead and drop our message there and then I'll, what's that, a period, space, please try again. And then we will uh, format that with our error, dot format, ERR. There we go. Okay, I'm going to break out of this. I'm going to clear this and run it one more time. What is your name? It is Sir Robin. I would like 10,000. Oh, no, we ran into an issue. There are only 100 tickets remaining. Please try again. 
There are 100 tickets remaining. Awesome. So I think we can move this final ticket over. How good does that feel? I am going to go run a demo for Monty Python and see what they think. They're going to love it. I know they're going to love it. This is looking great, and Monty Python thinks so too. I showed a demo to the group, and they realized that they forgot to include a requirement. They forgot that there is a service charge involved with each transaction. Can't sell tickets without a service charge, right? Now, this works a little differently. Each purchase, not each ticket, has a service charge of $2. Every time you demo your software, users will request additional features. It happens all the time. This is why it's important to get working software in front of your stakeholders. This is actually a good chance to take a look at our code and see if we can't refactor it a bit to make it more easy to read. Oh, there's a term we haven't touched on yet, refactor. Refactoring is when you take a look at your code and you improve it for readability or extensibility without changing how the program actually works. Let's see if we can't refactor that price calculation into a function and then add this new service charge. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna add a new card. And uh, this one is as an owner, I should receive a service charge so that I can pay others to maintain the software. I suppose that makes sense, right? Maintaining software can be super difficult for clients. Now, if there's an error, they'll need to pay developers somehow. So I hope some of that service charge makes its way to fellow developers. Because it might not be us that fixes it. You might pick up an application that's already working and you need to fix it. So let's move this into in progress. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of these comments here. Get rid of that one, and that one, and that one. Okay, looking good. All right. So let's first refactor our calculation into a function, right? Because currently we are calculating, where are we doing that calculation? Oh, right here. Num tickets equals times ticket price. So let's let's go ahead. I'm going to cut, cut this out. This is uh, command X or control X. So now it's on my clipboard. It's gone. And I'm going to add a function that we'll create here in a bit. And it should calculate the price of how many tickets there are. So sounds like a good name, calculate price. And we're gonna pass in the number of tickets, which we know is a valid number at this point. Go ahead and save that. And I'm gonna come up here to the top and here we go. Let's do this. Create the calculate price function. Let's use the proper name there, calculate price function. It takes number of tickets and returns, what do we have here? Num tickets plus ticket price. Let's make a new, cool. So create that function and return that value. All right, you got this. Pause me and create that function. Remember, it needs to take the number of tickets. All right, so here's what I did. So I defined calculate price and I required a parameter of number of tickets. I did a colon, open that body up, and there is no need to create a new variable. We can actually just return the result, right? So we're gonna return, and let's get lazy, this. Paste this here, but note that this is number of tickets. So I'm gonna say number of tickets. Now note how this refactoring puts this calculating price into a separate area than where this loop is at here. So uh, this loop will never really need to change. We can figure out what this calculation of the price is and other people could use it too, should they need to. We didn't need to do this, but we refactored and things should still work exactly the same. Let's go ahead and let's run it and make sure. Hey Bob, let's get two tickets. We got 20, yes I wanna proceed. 98 tickets left, awesome, perfect. So now that we have it refactored, what we should do is we need to add this service charge, right? So I'm just gonna go ahead, I'll put it in here and uh, we need to create a new constant uh, for the $2 service charge. And remember, that's once per transaction. And then we want to, um, add the service charge to what's due. 
Okay, you got this. Pause me and give those a go. You ready? Okay, so here's how I did it. So this service charge, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to come up here. I'm going to make a new constant, and I'm going to put it at the top of the file. If you ever look in here, the service charge, if we start charging too much for our developers, we need to bump this price up. We just bump it one place here. And then I used it in the calculate price function. So I'm going to get rid of this comment here, bring this back up. So we can just say plus service charge. But you know what? I'm going to think about my dear Aunt Sally, and I'm going to use some parentheses, even though I don't need to, because I know that multiplication will happen first and not the addition, but I'm going to do that because I think that that makes things more clear. Let's go ahead. Let's see how we did. I would like to have two tickets, $22 because of that service charge. And there we go. Great job. Now, I do like how if they change the way that this works, we know where to change things. It's right up here at the calculate price. And when you look at it used in this loop here, it's pretty clean, right? It's really clear that the price calculation is happening elsewhere and we don't need to worry about it here. If you wanted to calculate this on a different page, on like a shopping cart page, you could use that same function. It's reusable. We change it in one place. And you know what? I think we're done. Awesome job. I want you to take a minute and breathe in this program. Look at all the tools that you stitched together. You really have learned a ton, and you were able to build an entire application. You did an excellent job at immersing yourself in the Python programming language. Excellent work. You did it. You made it to the end of this course. Awesome job immersing yourself in the Python programming language. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I know I did. I had a bunch of fun putting this together. You picked up a ton of new skills in this course, and I want to remind you that the foundations that we went over here are present in just about every programming language that you'll encounter. Now, I know I've been sending you emails about this, but I really want to make sure that you know how important your voice is to our content creation process. We take your feedback and ideas very seriously, and I would love to know what you thought about this course. What did you love? What would you like to see improved? Our content and teaching methodology is ever-evolving, and it relies on your feedback. This course is a refresh, and we apply to all the wonderful thoughts, constructive criticism, and ideas that we gathered from its previous students. It truly made a difference in the final product. So let me thank you in advance for your thoughts. If you're looking to continue your programming journey, which I hope you are, and if you're not sure where to head next, please check the teacher's notes, and we'll get you pointed in the right direction. A person who programs in Python is called a Pythonista, and you, my friend, are definitely one now. Be proud to call yourself a Pythonista. You've done a ton of work and picked up a bunch of new skills. Okay, uno mas Spanish class analogy for you here, Pythonista. Even after years of studying Spanish, chances are, if a native Spanish speaker sparked up a conversation about quantum physics, you'd probably have a hard time to find the Spanish words to communicate. And that's because you've never learned those phrases in your training. But I'd bet, since you're so good at Spanish, that you'd be pretty confident that you could learn them. I hope that I've instilled that confidence in your ability to learn Python. I want you to say, I don't know how to do that yet, but I know I can learn it. And here's the thing. You just proved to yourself that you can. So what do you think? Think you've got the confidence to say that you can learn anything in Python? I know, you probably didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. And with that, I think I just met my quota of Monty Python jokes. There is more to learn, and that's always going to be the case in the tech industry. To be successful in this world, you really need to become a lifelong learner and I feel honored to have been part of your journey. I can't wait to see what you build. Until next time, I'll see you real soon.